Well, hello everyone. Laser Dave here, Dave Stevens here to give you another Third Thursday uh, laser seminar. Um, today's seminar is on plastics. It's one that I've been putting together over the last few months. A lot of good new, brand new content that I have created here for you today, covering a lot of different techniques and capabilities on plastics. Um, if you've never joined me before, please feel free to answer or ask any questions in the chat during the actual seminar, and we will either answer them at the end of the course, and I also have a team answering them dur the, during the course itself. And so if you have a basic question, uh, we can typically answer it very quickly. Um, if it's a more complex question, we will definitely wait at the end and, and answer it so that everyone can hear it. So. Thank you so much for joining us on this third Thursday and let's go ahead and get going. It is kind of a long seminar. It will be previously or pre-recorded um, so that you can have access to it at a later date as well. Um, but uh, we're gonna get going here quickly. Don't forget to answer or ask any of the questions that you may have during the event and we will definitely handle all of those. So today's course is on Sorry, some technical difficulties there. Sorry, uh, today's course is on laser processing plastic. Um, laser processing plastic is uh, a, a very interesting material and tends to work exceptionally well with lasers because laser is basically a heat source. Um, plastic tends to react well to heat. And so we're gonna cover all different types of plastic specifically designed for working with those types of plastics. This is a interactive course. So we actually have QR codes. So if you're not familiar with a QR code, turn on your camera app, point the camera at the QR code, but don't take a photo. And a link will show on your, on your screen of your mobile device. Select that link to get quick, easy access to web links, files, and videos. We are also a very social company. And if you wanna keep up with current events, trainings like this, products, applications, um, laser materials, please scan any QR code and subscribe to your favorite social media platform. We are on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and Twitter. So today's outline, we're gonna cover kind of an outline of plastics, um, plastics lasers reaction, what plastics to avoid with your laser. And then I'm gonna do an in-depth into the most common plastics. We don't have time to, of course, cover them all. So I'm gonna cover acrylics, ABS, uh, engraving plastic, PET, or your thin film mylar materials, as well as Delron plastic. Then we're gonna go through a little bit of the Trotec laser materials. And then final, uh, finally, we're gonna do a final end Q&A with myself and our Trotec Consumables man uh, Manager, uh, Alan Kriesney. So plastics are a wide range of synthetic or semi-synthetic organic materials that are uh, malleable and can be molded into solid objects. That's what makes them so advantageous. As you can see from this list, there are lots of different types of plastics out there. Um, and these are just some of the more common and specialist plastics that will uh, that, that are out there. There are also exotic ones that tend to be uh, derivatives of multiples com uh, combined together to create all new type plastics. And so because of this, there, are, there tend to be a lot of questions when it comes to laser processing these materials. Will it work? How does it work? What, what, what is different from this material to that material? Um, and unfortunately, because there are so many different variations of plastic, there are a lot of differences in how they respond to the laser. Um, and again, we're only gonna cover five of them, but I will give you an oversight of exactly what plastics work, what don't, and kind of what, what to expect when processing any type of plastic. So the basic laser reaction to plastics, most plastics can be laser processed, but each type of plastics may respond differently. Each polymer when laser cut or engraved will, will absorb the light from the laser, convert that light to heat, and then begin to depolymerize. Depending on the temperature or heat of each, uh, that each plastic can handle, which is called the flow point or the melt point, will determine the finished response. Plastics that be better handle heat 
will perform and react uh, to that laser heat, performing desirable, desirable re results in most cases. Where plastics that have a low heat tolerance may produce undesirable re results depending on the application. What this means is basically, if they melt easily, the laser has a harder time processing them. Um, if they if they do not melt as easy and they can handle heat better, the when the laser goes through, we don't see as much distortion in the surface of the material. And again, this depends on the application that you're processing the plastic with. Um, here's a great example at the bottom here. I've got in a piece of acrylic next to a piece of polystyrene. Um, acrylic handles heat much better. Um, it can handle a flow point or the, the flow point of acrylic is about 320 degrees. Where the flow point of polystyrene which is basically styrofoam or compressed styrofoam, uh, same, same material, it is only 212 degrees. What that means is when the laser goes through it, it tends to absorb more of that heat. We tend to get not as clean of an edge when cutting those materials. Uh, we'll tend to get a little more flare ups on those materials and the edge quality is not gonna be as good. So if you're unsure if a plastic will work with your laser, one of the main key things is, is kind of looking up what is the temperature that material can melt at? And what that temperature is, the lower that number tends to produce less de desirable results. That doesn't mean that it may not be a better result than other methods. So there's still, uh, it's still a good idea to go ahead and try that material. Um, and in most cases, uh, it's still really, really good. But if you need that perfect flame polished edge on something like polystyrene, it's never gonna look as good as something like acrylic. And so that's that's really what it comes down to acrylic or, or in any type of plastic is understanding how that material responds to heat. Now, there are some plastics that we do not recommend. Not that they won't work on the laser, that they can be damaged, uh, dangerous to the laser system and or your health. Um, no plastic, of course, you should breathe the fumes from the laser uh, that, are, that are processing, but some of the materials can be corrosive. So when materials like PVC, polyvinyl chloride or polyvinyl but uh, butyrol are laser engraved and or cut, over time, the outgassing that comes from burning these materials can actually cause chlorine gas to come out. And that chlorine gas mixes with uh, the atmosphere, creating hydrochloric acid. And that chlorine basically destroys the inside of your laser machine over time. This is not something that's going to happen quickly. Um, so be certain you understand what plastic you're processing. Um, because if you do it for days, weeks, months, or years, um, you can see this picture, which I found online. It, was, it wasn't many pictures online, but I found this picture online. This was destroyed with uh, uh, PVC-based material. So stay away from PVC. Other materials like Teflon, which is the polytetrafluoroethylenes, um, uh, they cut and engrave beautifully with the laser and they also don't cr produce chlorine, uh, but uh, like uh, Teflon, beryllium oxide and any materials creating halogenes, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, acetate, some of these actually can produce what's considered a nerve agent. And so when they outgas, they can be dangerous to your health. Um, some of them like uh, Teflon, they cut and engrave beautifully. Um, there, there's no actual outgassing that's damaging to your equipment. However, some of the fumes that come out of plastic, even after they're pulled out of the machine, can be dangerous when they're burned. And that's that's why we suggest staying away from this list of materials. Um, and so that that really is the difference. And so make sure this is the list. Any other plastic on the list will work with the laser. It may not work well with the laser, so I do suggest that you test it. But if you do come across any of these materials, you wanna stay away from them for obvious reasons uh, when it comes to health and damage to your equipment. So now we're gonna go through some of the more common plastics. Um, I, I don't have time, of course, to go through them all. We have too much. And so what I have done is I've picked the most common. Um, these five materials consist of, I would say about 85% of all laser companies out there processing plastic. Um, the remaining 15% is a barrage of the rest of the plastic. So this is gonna cover the majority of you folks out there running uh, plastics with your laser system. Um, and a lot of this information can be extrapolated into other plastics as well. In the future, I do plan on doing an additional plastics seminar on more of your exotic or engineering plastics, uh, but we just don't have time for all of them today. So today we're gonna cover acrylics, ABS, engraving plastic, 
PET or your polyester PETG material, as well as Delrin plastic. So the first one is acrylic, which is polymethyl methacrylate or PMMA. This is the, the scientific term for it. It's also known as acrylic. Acrylic naturally works extremely well with lasers. It was not designed for lasers, but it just, because it handles the heat very well, there is no piece of technology that works better with acrylic than lasers. And so they're kind of like peas and carrots in the fact that they just, they just naturally go well together. Uh, and that's why we have a lot of information on that. Now, that doesn't mean it's perfect, but acrylic is just one of those materials that is outstanding with lasers. Um, and so because of that, it has a ton of markets that work with the laser systems. Um, Acrylic trophies and awards, advertising, architectural models and construction, uh, digital printing, displays, decor and decoration, dimensional letters, point of sale materials, acrylic jewelry, outdoor and indoor signs, um, shop and exhibition stand construction, as well as so much more. Because it is such a diverse material and it cuts so well, if you're a laser owner or operator, you have the ability to get into any of these markets as well as so many more. And so it is, uh, it is just a great material to work with. Now, there are some differences on the acrylic types. And here is a good example. There are really two main types of acrylic out there. And so you want to be careful that when you go out and purchase acrylic, that you understand what kind of acrylic is that, that it is. There's really two main types of acrylic. There's cast acrylic and extruded acrylic. Cast acrylic is cast into a mold uh, uh, from glass and then submerged into warm water, and then it begins to be depolymerized or polymerized, which the polymerization takes place. Cast acrylic laser engraves white and cuts very well. Um, I got a little video here that really shows you the difference. So, cast acrylic is going to give you a nice frosty white effect, and we're going to get that nice uh, effect. And where extruded acrylic is heated to the melting point and extruded into sheets, kind of like pasta. So basically it's a molten mass of acrylic that's then extruded out of a, a sheet type stock uh, extruder. Um, but the difference is because the way the formula is in the way that the polymer chains actually cool, we get a totally different response in the laser. Um, the engraving appears opaque, almost transparent, and the laser cutting is good, but it can produce a little bit of an oily residue. So here's an example of extruded acrylic engraving. And as you can see, it just does not produce the same desirable results. So if you are out looking for acrylic and want the, uh, the cast or frosted effect, you want to make certain that you use a cast acrylic. If you don't care and you're just cutting the acrylic, extruded acrylic is fine. Um, and, that, and that's the real difference. Extruded acrylic tends to be less expensive. So lower cost acrylics, um, if you're just cutting it, um, it is a good alternative. It, neither one of them are damaging or, or a problem with your laser, but if there is the process of uh, needing the contrast, you can see the big difference here. Now, when it comes to acrylics, there are so many choices out there. Um, so many different assortments. Uh, opaque, glitter, mirror, varying thickness, colors, textures, finish combinations. So what this does is it gives you so many choices when it comes to diversity. Um, it naturally att uh, attracts the eye. That's what I really like about acrylic because it captures light. Um, it allows light to be transmitted through it so that you can backlight it, you can underlight it. Um, it refracts the light. So when you're using the clear material, it just has a wow factor to it. And then combined with the laser cutting ability of giving you a flame polished edge, it just, it just cut, hits all the bases. Now, there are a few things you want to, uh, the requirements that I do recommend when processing acrylic. Um, it doesn't take a lot of power to engrave. 30 plus watts is what I would recommend if you're going to be engraving a lot. So it doesn't take a lot of engraving power. Um, and for cutting, of course, more wattage, the thicker you're going to be able to cut, which we'll get into. If you are cutting it, I do suggest a cutting table. Um, we do offer a lot of different types of cutting table, as well as cutting tables specifically for acrylic. Uh, metal cutting tables can be a problem, uh, like our aluminum cutting grid, because you will see actual reflection points on the back side of the acrylic. So material cutting tables like the acrylic cutting table or the acrylic slat cutting table 
actually will keep that from happening. So understanding how it's going to respond, what cutting table is going to give you better results, especially if you're cutting the material. Air Assist is recommending, uh, is highly recommended, of course, especially if you're cutting it. Um, Acrylic is probably the number one material for causing flare-ups. And so you want to keep a very close attention to this material. Um, an air assist is a must because uh, if you are cutting, especially thicker material, it's going to tend to reduce the chance of flame. Never leave this material unattended with, of course, any material, but especially acrylic. You want to keep a very close attention to it, especially when cutting. Um, when you engrave it, of course, it does engrave beautifully, but um, if you are doing depth, we typically re uh, recommend multiple passes versus a slow speed, um, and we'll get into a little bit of that later. Um, and then, of course, surface masking or coatings are recommended if you want to do very deep engraving because it can actually stain or scorch or damage the surface of the acrylic from the heat. And again, we're going to get into more of this as we go through this. So the advantages and limitations here, um, laser itself has a lot of different advantages. Um, the advantages are that the laser can cut up to an inch thick uh, of the material with ease. Um, and this, of course, is going to depend on the wattage of the laser. You do need considerably more laser power to cut the thicker materials, but it is, um, it is something that no other technology can cut with that flame polished edge uh, like, like a laser system. You do get a clear flame polished edge achieved in a single step process with no post-processing. Most technologies that tend to cut acrylic are your routers and your mechanical cutters, and they cause a sawtooth or a rough edge, which tends to need to be sanded down and potentially flame polished to get the same look, requiring far more time to process. Lasers do not do that. Lasers can be engraved with a CO2 laser for a frosted or a matte finish into cast acrylic. So you get that frosted effect, especially if you're backlighting or underlighting the acrylic. It's a huge advantage because you get that beautiful look right out of the laser system with no uh, post or pre-processing. Um, fiber lasers can also mark on your dark like black colors, which we'll cover as well, uh, which produce a totally different effect on the, uh, onto your black acrylics. Now, there are some limitations. As I said earlier, flammability. Um, acrylic is basically liquid or, or, you know, compact oil. So you want to make certain you keep control over it all time. It is very flammable. It also scratches very easily. So protecting the acrylic in the pre and the post processing, if you're making signs or products out of it, you always want to try to protect it. Um, any movement across the table can scratch it and ruin your product very quickly. So you got to be careful in that case. And then finally, of course, uh, when laser processing, it does produce quite the smell. Um, the smell that comes from laser cutting and engraving is, is quite high, and so you want to make sure that it's properly ventilated. With any plastic, most plastics are going to smell or what we consider outgassing for what can be you know, 24 to 48 hours. What that means is after you pull the parts, the scrap or the finished laser cutting and engraving out of your laser system, it will produce an outgas or a smell for sometimes a few days. And so you wanna be careful with that too, because that, that's where some of the fumes come from. It's not from the lasering process, it's from the process after the lasering process, after it's been pulled out of the machine and you no longer have um, good ventilation on it. So if you do run or process a lot of acrylics, make sure that you have a nice ventilated area for the laser to sit after it has been finished laser processing. And this pretty much holds true with any plastic. If you're doing lots of plastics, make sure you ventilate it afterwards. Um, and it, after a day or two, that smell and it, uh, that uh, the fumes will stop. Now, engraving acrylic um, is, is very easy. It's an easy process. It requires very little material preparation. Um, best engraving results achieve when the surface of your acrylic is very lightly etched. And so you don't want to engrave with a lot of power, just, a, just enough power to create a frosted effect. Um, dialing in the power settings at high, high speed is recommended. Too much power and you're going to get a little bit of um, white kind of snowy type material. And most of the case with a, a with a like a terry cloth or a, uh, a micro suede type uh, rag, you can wipe it easily off without scratching it. But too much of it you, requires 
a brushing and some other issues. And so you want to very lightly engrave the acrylic without too much power. If deep engraving is required, we do recommend running multiple passes and so that that residue doesn't have time to really form. So instead of running it very, very slowly uh, at, at say, um, you know, 10% speed, I would run it at, you know, six passes at 60% speed so that I have less removal of materials and the laser has less time to build up that residue. Um, this will prevent that snow-like residue from forming when you're in doing the engraving process. Now, in some cases that's not possible and I will show you a little bit later exactly what, um, how to combat that or sometimes to how to just clean that up. So here's a simple engraving of a lighted, uh, 3D looking image that's already been pre-cut and, and then being engraved. And so as you can see here, acrylic engraved is very, very nice. It's very lightly etched. Um, you, the little spots that you see on the surface is that snowy residue. Even at light engravings, you can get that off. But again, uh, I typically use just a simple little cloth and it'll wipe right off and give you that finished nice effect. And then of course you can light it up in this case, showing all the different colors and uh, really, really see that effect. And so this is a simple piece of acrylic. Uh, engraved with an intricate design, and you can really see how it can it captures the light and it stands out. It almost looks 3D in its look because of the way the design is, but it's still only a two-dimensional object. Now, cleaning acrylic is a can be a problem. There are some things I do suggest if you do get that snowy residue on it. If you do use like uh, an extruded acrylic and you have some oily residue, I would suggest a, a hexane cleaner. Uh, hexanes are a petroleum-based uh, uh, cleaner-based material. Um, it is a solvent-based material, and so you do want to, you don't want to leave it on a lot, and you do want to use gloves with this stuff, but it works exceptionally well with acrylics, as well as any plastics. Um, I actually worked with a chemist for years to find out exactly how, what materials work best with plastics. And after lots of trial and error, we found that hexanes as well as heptane, which is a derivative of, of that also work because it is a formulation from the petroleum industry and uh, fuel, um, just like plastic is. And so they tend to work very well together. Um, I did find out that this material cannot ship in California. So you do need, if you happen to be unfortunately in California, you will have to find it locally. Um, in a pinch too, I have found also lighter fluid works almost as well. So uh, it will work as well with that. And the reason I say this is if you do have residue that forms on it, the one thing that most people will tend to go to is uh, uh, alcohol-based cleaners. And that is a big no-no when it comes to cleaning acrylics or any type of acrylic-based plastic. Alcohol cleaners, um, any of your solvent-based, alcoholic-based cleaners that were distilled instead of converted from a petroleum product will cause acrylics to cause micro fissures on cracks. And so you get these little fractures that will form in your engraving and your cutting areas when you use an alcohol-based cleaner or an alcohol-based paint to paint these materials. So if you're painting the acrylic, you want to make certain that that paint is not based with alcohol. If you're cleaning it, um, then you want to make certain that that is not based with, or there's no alcohol in the cleaners. What will happen is it will look just fine after you're finished with it. And then over time, you're going to see these little fissures and fractures that you can see in this photo form onto the edge or into the engraving of the, uh, of the, of the acrylic. And so stay away from any alcohol-based cleaners when it comes to cleaning acrylic that's been laser cut or engraved. Here's another little laser hack. Typically acrylic is run at 500 DPI. 500 DPI uh, can, can produce some nice effect. You can see a little snowy residue and you get that nice clean finish result, but it takes for a lot of time. If you run acrylic at very low resolution, and this is low resolution, at uh, we get a very fast response, but a rough finished. And so here's a, a great little laser hack for processing acrylic, what we'll do is we'll actually take the material out of focus, um, both the engraving, and I'll engrave the, the actual image at 125 dpi in this case. Then I'm going to put an outline around it, and I'm going to vector outline it with a very low amount of power, again, out of focus, giving me a cleanup effect. Basically, this is a great effect if you're doing large signs, if you want it to be backlit, but yet seen close up as well as far away, and where you can triple your productivity of engraving by getting that frosted background 
um, but still get that nice finished look. And so great little laser hack when processing large signage with acrylic, run at low resolutions, um, a little bit out of focus or your beam is uh, going to be broadened out a little bit and then run an outline around your characters. Not, not enough power to cut through, just enough power to just mark into it. Again, out of focus so that it broadens the beam on uh, signage type stuff that's not too detailed. And you can triple your productivity. And um, in, in my opinion, especially when you light this up and look at it from a distance, it looks more frosted, um, as well as, of course, look at the time difference on this little, uh, this is like two inches by four inches um, engraved at 500 DPI in over two minutes. Um, and 125 DPI at only 47 seconds. So great little process to hack for processing or engraving acrylics. If you do want to engrave a little more depth into acrylic and you start to see that snowy, flaky residue, we can also see staining or damage to the acrylic when you overpower it. And in that case, I have another little laser hack when doing acrylic, and that is using common everyday household dish soap. Dish soap provides a natural frame, flame retardancy to the surface of plastics. And this will work on any plastic. But if you don't want to mask it, but you do want to engrave a little bit of depth into it, place a little bit of dish soap on it. It doesn't have to be dry. Um, and then just stick it in the laser and engrave it. And so here it's engraved side by side with and without at the same time with the same power and speed settings. I'm overpowering on purpose in, in one pass just to sh show a, an example here. Um, and then I'm gonna engrave them and I'm gonna show you the difference between the two. After you're finished, we'll go ahead and rinse each of the two parts off. And then we'll take a closer look here to see the difference in this case. So because dish soap provides a basically a little thin film flame retardant barrier, it, pretend, it prevents this from happening. And so you can see here by overpowering a little bit, the excess heat from the laser has actually not only stained, but distorted the acrylic. Um, microscopically, these little stains have actually frosted the acrylic from the excess heat that came out of the engraving process. This is why we said earlier to run multiple passes or, or, or we would need to mask it. So the dish soap kind of keeps you from having to mask and peel off all the intricate little pieces and eliminates this process from happening. Um, this is not a cure-all, of course. If you go too deep, it still may not protect it. So this is kind of that in-between and allow you to hit it with a couple harder passes and still get that clean finished result without having to physically mask it with something like a paper masking tape. So that's a great little laser hack for uh, processing that material. And so that, uh, that is the different methods of engraving acrylics. Um, uh, the other one here is, of course, the type of uh, engraving. So here's a, an engraving with a CO2 laser on black acrylic. It does a good job, again, frosts the acrylic itself, just like it did on the clear or the you know, other colors of acrylic. But compare that with a fiber laser. A fiber laser tends to react very differently to acrylic. And instead of engraving into it, what it does is it removes pigment only and actually removes that pigment, bringing it back to its original contrast uh, of acrylic itself and turning it white. And so if you have a fiber laser and you want that really vibrant, white, bright effect into the acrylic, this only works on the black acrylics. Um, it doesn't work on other colors of acrylic, but it does It does provide a much, much higher contrast. Uh, fiber laser will not cut acrylic, really doesn't work on any other acrylics uh, or, or colors, but it really does uh, show you the difference that can be done. If you do have a laser that has both CO2 and fiber, um, you can cut, of course, with your CO2, and then you can mark with a fiber laser to get that different effect. Now, that was pretty much all there is to do for cutting or engraving the acrylic. For cutting the acrylic, there are some many other laser hacks. Um, you want to make sure you, of course, use the correct wattage for material thickness. A general rule of thumb, if you want a really nice flame polished edge, is about 10 watts of laser power for every 40 thousandths or one millimeter thickness of acrylic. And so as you go up in thickness, you're going to go up in wattage. <clears throat> you also, when cutting acrylic, always want to cut in one pass. Uh, so I get the response a lot of times. I have multiple, uh, I have a, a low wattage laser, so I'll hit it with three passes. Yes, that will work. One, it's going to potentially increase the chance of a flare up or flame. And two, the edge quality is going to be dramatically compromised when you do that. You're going to see where the one pass stopped 
and the other one started. So it will compromise your edge quality. If edge quality is not important, that's still possible, but I do highly suggest it be cut in one pass. You also want to defocus or adjust the focus of your laser and use the correct lens. Um, defocusing or focusing into the material by about a third of the thickness of the material will give you a straighter cut. Um, this only holds true up to a certain amount of thickness, otherwise you're going to potentially increase the risk for flame. But I do suggest focusing slightly into the material. Um, uh, unlike science fiction shows, lasers aren't perfectly parallel. As they become further out of focus, a laser is more like an hourglass in shape. What that means is it diverges to a point like an hourglass, and then it converges away from that point. So the further away or thicker material you go, the more angle you're going to actually see. And depending on what lens you're processing with, will depend on how much angle that's going to be. And so longer lenses are gonna give you a straighter cut. However, your beam diameter is gonna be larger. And so sometimes using a smaller lens like a two or a two and a half inch lens and focusing into it can kind of split the difference and give you a straight cut without too much kerf or removal of the material so you can still cut at a decent rate of speed. There also is a diminishing return. As you go through thicker and thicker material, because the beam becomes larger, the time becomes exponentially longer. So the time to cut an eighth inch piece of acrylic is not twice as long to cut a quarter of an inch. It becomes considerably longer here. And so here's a good example here. What I have done is I have literally cut um, five different thicknesses all at the same time. And I time lapse this because you don't want to wait the 15 minutes to see the difference. But the difference here is really seeing the time. An eighth of an inch cut this five by five inch gear out in only 30 seconds. Where a quarter of an inch, which is twice the thickness, took a minute and 40. And as you can see, as we go thicker and thicker, up to five eighths, up to three quarter, the process time to cut the same file out is over 15 minutes. Because the beam is becoming much larger as you go through the surface of the material, it takes more and more time to cut. And so this is why we suggest higher and higher wattages for cutting through thicker materials. Um, this was all cut with a speedy 80 watt, which pushed an 80 watt right to its limit for cutting up to three quarter. I don't typically recommend doing that, but it is possible. Um, but there are some techniques I'm going to show you to reduce the chance of flare ups, which is one of the biggest issue when processing these materials. But here, this is a great example of different thicknesses cut side by side on the same wattage, um, all different thicknesses, and you can see the difference in time to get the same type of edge quality, a nice flame polished edge. The other thing is, is of course, you want to use the right power settings when cutting acrylic. Um, at least 60 watts or higher for, for quarter inch acrylic cutting. Uh, for cutting cast acrylic, we recommend, recommend a high frequency. Uh, higher frequency is basically increasing the amount of laser pulses. More laser pulses. Think of a frequency like a, a sewing machine stitch. Um, a high stitch pattern is a high frequency. So you get more pulses as you're going through the same distance of material. What that does is it produces more heat. And a material like acrylic that can handle heat and gives us a flame polished edge, this is a good thing. Materials like polystyrene, we would run a low frequency because too much heat can actually cause damage. And so that's what frequency or also known as PPI or pulses per inch does for you. Higher the frequency, the more the heat, and, ten, and we tend to see more of a flame polished or a smoother edge quality. So make sure you use the right speed and frequency. Make sure you're focused into it properly, especially on the thicker materials. You're running slow enough to get through the material. And then finally, making sure to run the, the high frequency so that you get it or high PPI so that you get that flame polished edge. Um, the acrylic slat cutting table or the acrylic cutting grid table is ideal for cutting your thinner materials because you're going to get a no reflection on the back side. Um, cutting on a metal table, on if you stick acrylic directly on a metal table, uh, it will the beam will actually hit the, the table, which doesn't affect most materials. But on acrylic, we tend to see a small little reflection point. And so cutting on the slat table, the acrylic grid tables will keep that from happening. Um, you can also elevate the acrylic over it if you only have the metal table, and that will do the same. Um, by, by, that will also reduce those reflection points. So when cutting acrylic, 
You also want to choose the large nozzle. Um, Trotec has multiple nozzles with a laser system. Um, the larger nozzle is going to reduce the amount of airflow coming out. So it's not distributing so much air volume down through the cut. When you're cutting acrylic, if you focus a ton of air down through the acrylic as it's cutting, what it does is it tends to whip or mix air bubbles into that cut, making the top side of that cut become almost frosted looking because it's injecting bubbles into it. By running a large diameter cone, it dissipates the air a little bit, keeping the flame down, but it's going to keep that injection into the acrylic from happening. I'm kind of giving you the best of world, uh, best of both worlds, uh, while it, it, in additionally running the max airflow um, of two to three PSI. Now for cutting very thick acrylic, um, we do suggest you always remove the especially paper mask. When it is a paper type mask, it tends to have uh, paraffin into the surface. And this is really the one of the main reasons for causing flaming, especially on the top side. Um, the acrylic slack cut table or elevating above is also ideal for keeping the backside uh, clean. I do like to leave the acrylic or the paper on the backside because if you do have any flare up, um, it is nice to uh, protect it a little bit. Uh, but there is very little you can do if you do get a flare up on the backside. You want to really be careful with it. The other thing is, is if you're cutting very thick acrylic, do not use the acrylic cutting grid table. Um, too much heat builds up. It can actually ignite that table. So you don't want to use that, that table for very thick stuff. Um, I'm going to show you an example or, or uh, a laser hack here on cutting acrylic on how to negate the re or reduce the chance of any type of flare ups on the backside. Because that is the number one problem when cutting thick acrylic. How to reduce the flame when cutting it out. Um, we need the heat in order to cut the acrylic, but we don't want the excess heat to cause an ignition source, which is going to destroy your material and or in the machine if not taken care of. So be very careful on that. So I have a great little laser hack that I've come up after years of research. I've tried just about everything in the book, um, and I have found something to kind of keep that backside. Because when you get a, a flare up on the backside of the material, this is what happens. Um, after you pull it out of the machine, the paper backing or the plastic backing tends to be distorted. Um, and then when you peel it off, you get this very distorted look under the surface of the material. This is, of course, not desirable. So I have a laser hack here um, that I, I have tried just about everything over the year. We've tried nitrogen. We've tried different air fissures. We've tried elevating. We've tried everything. And I found a very, very simple laser hack. And in my experience, this has found, in my, from, from my experience, it has eliminated flare-ups on the backside 100% of the time, at least testing in my lab. Still, of course, want to keep in touch with it. Uh, or keep, keep keep an eye on it, but that is using common everyday paper towels. And you may think, what? Why would a paper towel be at work? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three to four layers of paper towel, and I'm going to get it soaking wet. And I'm going to place it onto my vector grid. This can be on, uh, it needs to be on the aluminum vector grid in this case. And then I'm going to go ahead and cut out a piece of half inch acrylic uh, with the letter B onto a piece of it. And so what's happening is the laser is going through the half inch acrylic here, through into the wet paper towel. And that paper towel is actually dissipating any chance of backside flare up. And it works exceptionally well. Also with enough layers, it tends to reduce any reflection points on the backside, giving us a nice clean effect. Now you do wanna make sure you have enough layers on there. Um, if not, you can also elevate it over the cutting table. So this is, I used a little T-pin here, which I cut out of also acrylic, place it as a, a marker. And then I'm gonna place a wet paper towel underneath that. Acrylic over the top of that. And then we're gonna go ahead and cut that out. And this is nice because you can actually see what's gonna happen underneath of it here. I'll give you a view underneath. The laser's going through the acrylic and the excess energy is hitting that moist paper towel, converting that excess heat to steam. That steam is being dissipated and it's encapsulating all those polymers that tend to ignite with moisture and reduces the chance of any type of flare up. And that's why this works so well. And so this is a great, uh, uh, great laser hack to 
eliminate the backside. Now it is kind of messy. Um, and the moisture is not going to damage your cutting table, but of course you want to make sure that you have enough moisture. Um, when I'm doing large areas, it can tend to dry out. So I want to use enough layers to where it doesn't dry out over time. So it is kind of a messy process, but I have found in my, uh, my, my testing, um, here it is with three quarters of an inch. Again, pushing the absolute maximum of a 80 watt laser. This one is nice because you can really, really see it there. The excess power is just pumping through and that steam is keeping a three quarter of an inch piece of acrylic from igniting on the backside, which is unheard of, uh, especially elevated like that. And you can see the front and the backside, how thick this piece of acrylic. That is 20 millimeter or three quarters of an inch of acrylic. Um, pushing to the limits, so the edge quality is not quite as good as say a half inch, but uh, it does still work very well. And the kick here is after it's done, I took and pulled up the paper towel and the laser energy didn't even penetrate through it. So what that's doing is it's stopping all that excess energy from causing damage on the backside of your acrylic. This is the number one problem for cutting thick acrylic. So I really wanted to illustrate um, the, the, the method that I have found to do this. Now take, of course, keep close attention, never leave your laser unattended, um, play with it. Um, this is only in a laboratory. I haven't done this a lot. And so make sure you play around with it and keep close attention on this. But it, it in my experience and my testing, this has been 100% successful. I've yet to have a single flare up when done properly. Now, some other fun stuff here. I'm going to just show you some other engraving uh, uh, acrylic. Uh, the next one is uh, 3D and acrylic. Because acrylic can handle 3D type materials like wood, we can run relief mode at 1,000 DPI, and I'm going to hit with high power. And then in between passes, I'm going to actually brush it off in place with a brush. Um, and I'm going to blow it and try to remove as much of that snowy-like material and hit it again and again and again, however many passes you want to do this with. And then the really neat thing about acrylic and a laser is we can do something called the flame polish. So I'm going to take a black box and I'm going to engrave it out of focus by a half an inch. So I'm going to go away from it and I'm going to engrave it at 125 DPI at a half an inch away. And what this is going to do is flame polish the surface of the acrylic after it's done. This is going to kind of blend everything together to give us that nice finished flame polished molded look. You will still see a little bit of the engraving pattern in the background, but it really does produce a nice, neat effect um, so that we can actually turn a frosted white cast acrylic back to an opaque clear acrylic by using the laser out of focus to run a glaze pattern over it. Um, and I've taken that to a step further. This is a cool, uh, cool pattern where I, I cut out this little fishy. And then we're gonna engrave this pattern onto it, which is basically a three-dimensional pattern of fish scales. And so when I'm gonna engrave with a high power, in this case, one pass, and I'm gonna engrave these fish scales into the surface of this, this uh, fish. And so once this is finished in, in using the relief mode, so 3D, so this is actually creating a three-dimensional effect into it, and I'm gonna slightly brush it in place. Again, I used a template so it's not moving. And then I'm going to engrave my detail. So I'm going to blow off any excess detail. And I'm going to engrave my detail out of focus at 125 DPI. So in this case, I've taken the laser away from the acrylic by half an inch. And I ran the file or the detailed component of the file at 125 DPI. So this is very fast away from the material. And what's going to happen is it's only going to selectively glaze the surface of this cast acrylic. What this is going to do is basically make the black areas back black again, making them opaque or clear. So that when we're finished, we get a very unique effect. This is a really, really neat effect that I like working with acrylic because you get this almost transparent looking, opaque textured looking finish where it's frosted in certain areas. And I don't know any other technology that could do something like this. Um, when you backlight it, it really, really, really stands out and kind of captures the light because all that texture is really going to pop. And so here's an example of the, the finished example with a, with a backlight behind it. So just a neat effect. Acrylic is just an awesome material to work with. You do want to be careful with it. It does produce a lot of fumes. Uh, it smells a lot. Um, it can be tricky. It scratches easy, but you can pr produce some spectacular uh, imagery and artwork or products with this material.
TroTech does sell quite a bit of acrylic. Um, it is a great resource for you. We sell the color gloss, the Tro Class Duo, the frosted satins, LED material that allows light to go through it. Reverse acrylic that's coated on one side. So if you want to reverse paint fill or reverse backlight a piece, only the engraved areas will come through. Clear acrylic in multiple thicknesses, mirrored acrylic, metallic acrylics, glitter acrylic. So Acrylic, uh, Trotec itself has a, is a great resource if you are looking to buy laser bolt acrylic. Um, we have a, a large range of acrylic sheets in the variety of colors, different finishes, uh, degrees of transparency, but these are all specially designed for laser. We know they work. We have preset files uh, and the database settings are all pre-programmed for the Troglass acrylic. So you know the settings in your database are going to be preset for it. And that is the advantage of sticking with um, our brand of acrylic because it will guarantee your results because we have tested it from its inception through its manufacturing and testing all the way through to the end product to you. So great resource for that to produce all types of wonderful acrylic applications. Um, this is just a great material to work with. So any questions, please make sure to leave them in the comment section on acrylic. Um, that's all I'm gonna cover on acrylic. I, can, I, I, I think I could go all day on this product since it's such a unique, uh, uh, advantageous material to work with your laser system. The next one is a little bit more obscure when it comes to the laser, and that is ABS plastic. Um, uh, uh, let me see if I can pronounce this, the uh, uh, cryoneurobutadiene uh, styrene. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the scientific version or, or verbiage of them is always uh, comical to me, but it's very known as ABS plastic. ABS plastic is probably one of the most common plastics on the planet. Um, you see it everywhere and you don't even know it. And so because of that, it is very commonly laser processed. And this is why I want to cover it today. Um, ABS plastic is a opaque, impact resistant, engineering thermoplastic um, amorphous polymer. Uh, has extremely high rigidity, it's impact, insulating properties, stain resistant, um, high dimensional stability. So it's very strong, unlike acrylic, which is brittle. If you were to drop a part like this on the floor of acrylic, it would shatter into pieces. ABS does not have that problem. It's extremely durable. It's also strong heat and chemical resistances, and it's UV stable, just like acrylic is also UV stable, but this is also shockproof. It's, uh, you're not going to be able to break it. It's not brittle like acrylic, and that's something I think I forgot to cover in the acrylic. It is a very brittle material. Um, it's commonly used for tools, tool handles, identification, animals, packaging, electronic housings, automotive, appliances, aerospace, um, ABS filaments is commonly used for your 3D printers. So if you're 3D printing, a lot of the times um, you can use different types of plastic, but ABS is a common 3D printer. Toys, Lego blocks, it's a common one. Um, your keyboard and your mouse, most of your computer outside, your hardware, lots of your, most of your electronic components um, that are made of plastic are made of ABS. Yes. And so that's why this is such a popular material. So many products these days utilize this material. And because of that, the question arises, how does it laser process? When I get this component, this material, this sheet stock or this product, how do I laser engrave it? How is it going to perform? And that's why we want to cover this very common material. CO2 Advantages and limitations to ABS, um, it is, it, it, the advantage is that it can cut up to a quarter of an inch. I mean, it's not a material I would cut much thicker than a quarter of an inch because it does have a much higher or a lower melt factor than, say, acrylic. So even with high wattages, a uh, quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit higher if you've got very high wattages, but I don't suggest much thicker than that. Um, fiber lasers also work exceptionally well on all colors and will mark all colors of uh, uh, ABS plastic, unlike any other plastic. It is probably one of the better marking plastics for fiber laser, which we'll get into. It's also strong and UV stable and extremely common, and this is why we want to cover it. Um, the limitations, it is low contrast for laser, CO2 laser marks. So when we're engraving it with CO2, we're not going to see as much contrast because it does not produce that bright frosted white like we saw on the acrylic. It's also difficult to CO2 laser cut over a quarter of an inch. So I don't suggest if you got thick material of this, uh, it is very difficult to cut thick material. Uh, we do have flare ups and flame ups, and I don't suggest doing more than that thickness in most cases. It's flammable when laser cut edges, 
can produce a slight melted edge look. Um, it's not near as clean as, say, something like acrylic. It also, just like acrylic, will produce a very foul smell that will take 24 to 42, 72 hours, some cases, for that smell to dissipate and go away. So after you're finished processing it, understand there will be an outgas from this material, but it will eventually dissipate. Now, engraving it, I do, it is a very power dependent material, does require a lot of power. So lower wattages will work, but they're gonna be much, much slower. If you wanna utilize the speed of your laser system, I do suggest 60 plus watts or more. Um, cutting table for cutting it, um, it doesn't matter what kind of cutting table, they all work very well. You don't get the reflection points or anything when cutting this material. Air assist is highly necessary, um, as well as any acrylic, I do suggest air assist. Um, masking is recommended for deep engraving um, and, of course, cutting. Uh, I typically will do masking on this material for any deep engraving and definitely cutting. Um, and then also, in order to produce contrast, I will typically mask it and engrave through the mask to produce a paint fill. Uh, masking is uh, going to kind of protect the surface as well because, again, just like acrylic, it can be scratched up over time, but it's not as easily scratched as something like acrylic. So here is a CO2 laser engraving, just standard black ABS plastic. You can see the acrylic or the, the plastic or the ABS plastic produces an okay contrast, a little bit of a melty background, but the contrast and sharpness is clean. It's concise. It is legible, but very low contrast. There's not a bright white or uh, a, a difference when it comes to uh, contrast. And so if you're wanting to do something like a barcode or something like that, it can be difficult to get those type of barcodes because the contrast is just not there. Um, another little laser hack to do that is to convert your graphic to grayscale. Um, especially when doing the lighter colors, the grayscale is going to provide more of a patterning effect. Um, the reason I will do it as a grayscale is that after it's done engraving, you can see there's almost no contrast. The grayscale will half tone it. And so if you wanted to rub a little bit into smooth surface, this only works on the smooth surface and you can rub some paint down inside of it and you can kind of see the half toning or the grayscale effect. But what that does is it kind of encapsulates the paint and allows you to rub it down inside. This will allow that contrast to kind of pop out, especially on the lighter colors of ABS when processed with a CO2 laser. For cutting the material, um, again, high wattage is uh, recommended. It is at high wattage. Uh, lower wattages will, of course, cut it, but I do suggest a little more wattage, 60 plus watts. Cutting table, air assist. I do highly suggest masking when cutting ABS plastic, typically on both sides. Um, thick ABS, 120 watts, masking on both sides, um, and also a vacuum cutting table. And when we're cutting the material, this, this material tends to cut very, very well. Again, I do like to put a mask in. You can see the staining that comes off of the surface, especially on the black, um, that is protected from the mask, uh, mask over the surface of the material. Um, and then we can go ahead and cut that product out. I typically run a low frequency when cutting this material at high power and just enough speed to cut through so that I don't get as much melting. You can see the backside, a little bit of a flare and that protected mask will actually protect the surface. And then after you're finished, all you need to do is just peel that mask off. And here's a nice high tensile strength fan cover, which is a very common component that, that has been cut out of the ABS plastic. Um, the edge quality looks good. Um, it is a little more melty than, say, acrylic, but it is far more acceptable than, say, um, um, other methods of doing this. And so it does give you a nice clean effect. You can see the edges are a little bit more melty, but it does still look very, very sharp, very, very clean. Now, the difference between CO2 and fiber lasers um, ABS is ideal for fiber lasers. And so we just saw the engraving on CO2 lasers on black. Um, and then also on white. So you can see the contrast is very, very low. Where a fiber laser, whether you're running a fiber laser with a Galvo laser, which I'm gonna demonstrate here, or a CO2 or a flatbed laser, it does not matter. The Galvos are a little faster. So here we'll hit start on the Galvo here. And you can see the difference. And so black ABS plastic will turn stunningly white onto the surface of the, of the plastic here. And this, produces a 
unbelievable effect. Um, and it actually is like a bright white. And so what's happening is the Galvo fiber laser is actually changing the polymer state to produce the contrast. And the nice thing is if you're using whites or yellows or greens, you get a dark contrast. No other plastic will do this. And so you get that nice contrasted mark when using a fiber laser. Um, and there are a couple different types of fiber lasers out there. Um, there's standard fiber lasers and there are uh, uh, what's called a MOPA fiber laser. I do suggest a MOPA fiber laser, which is a special fiber laser for marking on the ABS plastics, even on the other types of plastics, because it's going to produce a brighter contrast than a standard. A standard one will work, but a MOPA laser will produce a much brighter white, especially on materials like plastics um, or, or like your uh, ABS plastics. Most plastics, you're going to get a better effect on it. So if you are looking to do a lot of fiber marking on plastics, the MOPA is your better choice of the two. There's two standard types of fiber lasers, your tr traditional or conventional fiber laser and the MOPA, which gives you more control. And so MOPA gives you the control uh, by basically controlling the pulse duration uh, between four and 200 nanoseconds. Because of this, it offers those pul the, the, uh, more of a, an effect into plastics. And so, I mean, you may look at that keyboard in front of you on your computer, um, the, the, the lettering that's put on with a fiber laser. Um, you know, most of your electronic components, the back of your phones, you know, the, the uh, here, here's one that I personally did on a MOPA fiber laser, which is uh, my personal Apple AirPod uh, case, which is made of white ABS. And here on a fiber laser, I'm able to put the Apple logo on it in the matter of seconds. And so just a great material. It is a stunning process. Um, actually, the, the, the marks that are marked on the case already are done with a MOPA fiber laser. You can see them with all the little, you know, made in Cal or designed in California and stuff like that. It's all done that way. So Marking plastics, especially ABS plastics, if you are interested in more of their MOPA fiber lasers um, or working with the ABS plastics, here's some more information on that. If you're looking for information on where to get ABS plastic, because it's not your common plastic, you're not typically going to find this at your uh, local hardware store. You're not going to find it at your uh, awards and engraving or your laser laser uh, supply houses and stuff like that that tend to sell laserable materials. And so the su supplier that I typically use is, is McMaster Car, which is an industrial. They, they sell a half a million products more towards the industrial type marketplace. And so if you need a quick sheet of ABS plastic, but the key is mainly not as much on the sheet products. It is the products themselves. And so if you have a component um, that is brought in and they need to mark it. You can confirm that it is ABS plastic and they need a contrast mark. You know that you would need a fiber laser to do that um, or a printer or other methods to do that. If it just needs to be cut, you're making electronic housing or boxes, then of course, mask it, cut it out with your CO2 laser to produce the effect um, to, to, uh, uh, th that is necessary. So that is ABS plastic. Um, again, let us know if you have any questions on that material. Very, very common plastic, one that we come across all the time and is um, very laser friendly. Now, the next one is engraving plastic. Um, unlike acrylic and ABS plastic, this material is specifically designed for the laser industry. And what's funny about this material is the first two materials I covered, acrylic and ABS, engraving plastic is a combination of both. So this is a hybrid or a derivative of the two types of materials, as well as in some cases, a few other types of plastics designed specifically for the laser industry. And so engraving plastic is different in the fact that it is designed for laser engraving to produce contrast. And the reason that is, is they we use two-part polymer-based specific materials that are engineered for laser and uh, uh, laser CO2 laser engraving systems. And that's because it has a thin cap or top layer um, as well as a contrasting core layer. So it's basically two colors laminated together produce, to produce the contrast. And that's why it's specifically designed for the laser industry. Some versions even offer caps or, or a cap layer on both sides. And so if you're doing a two-sided sign, you could have, in this case, a yellow on the surface, a black core, and yellow on the other side, for example, or red on the other side, uh, uh, or red on both sides, example. So basically, the way this stuff works is the cap layer absorbs the light of the laser, converts it to heat. The heat causes a material directly in the laser's path to be ablated. Um, the exposed core layer will create 
high contrast engraving, um, and the edges will be clean and smooth. There are a lot of different brands out there. Trolays is the Trotec brand, but also companies like Romark, Scott, Gemini, IPI all make this type of plastic. They're all very similar in the way that they're made. Most of the colors are very similar. And basically, they all kind of do the same thing. You are able to engrave through that cap layer into the core layer to produce the contrast. Laser, of course, does not produce color. And so artificially, we need to actually buy materials sometimes when you need that OSHA certified yellow on black sign, for example, um, or if you need you know, a specific color combination. And that is the difference. And um, the nice thing about this material is it comes in hundreds of different options, color combinations, uh, metallic colors, textures, scratch resistant material. You can get very thin foil like materials that can be engraved onto the surface and then peeled and stuck on because it's very, very thin like sticker materials. There's indoor versions, which are less expensive, which tend to have um, uh, that are not UV stable. And then there's outdoor, a little more expensive UV stable versions. Um, there's ADA versions of the plastic, which are specifically designed to be the right thickness, which we'll cover on the cutting section in, uh, here in a few minutes. There are reverse, which uh, the, the core is actually clear. And then the one, the backside is say black or, or green or yellow. And then when you etch away that, it produces an opaque or a window, which you can then backlight or you can fill it with color and produce co your any color combination you want or multiple colors together. So that's why this stuff is so advantageous. It is very diverse, comes an unbelievable amount of choices um, from metallics to woods to colors. Um, and then it also gives you the ability to uh, engrave with that high contrast, high detail on it. Very commonly used in especially the laser industry for your data plates, your signage, uh, your labels, uh, name plates, displays, switchboards. Also very commonly used in architectural models um, because you can get the metallic. It actually looks like brushed aluminum or brass or stainless steel. Um, it, it actually looks like metal. And so many people are like, how can you cut that metal? Because it looks so much like metal. So this is uh, because the plastic comes with these metallic looks, even though they're not made of metallic, they look like it. And then they engrave to say uh, to your color into the core. So if you've got a black core uh, with a silver metallic surface, you get that me metallic look on the surface. And so that's what's so nice about the material. Um, advantages on the laser system, because it is designed for the laser system, there are, of course, a lot of advantages. Um, ideal for laser processing, exterior or interior. Uh, laminates are designed in a variety of colors. Um, it's great for signage uh, with high perceived value, cost-effective production, high speed. It can pr produce, of course, extremely precise engraving, uh, reliable non-contact uh, processing. Everything from, we can see here, some rulers, the decor. Uh, one of the popular ones lately has been the ear, ear savers on the backside of, uh, for your masks, uh, very, because it is kind of a flexible material because it does have a bit of the ABS as well as acrylic. It's got the shock absorbency of your ABS material, but also the durability and in some cases, the UV stability of acrylics. So some of the best of all the worlds. Um, and that's why the, there are so many different advantages. Um, there are, of course, some limitations as well. Again, you gotta be careful, not all of it is UV stable. Make certain when you're ordering it, if it's gonna be used for outside, make sure you buy the UV stable version of this material. Um, so you wanna make certain of it or keep it labeled or separated. Um, the UV st stuff is a little more expensive because it has more, uh, more of the acrylic side into it, so it is more protected for the outside. Also, some of it, uh, it looks the same, but it's made for mechanical engravers and not lasers, which is not going to perform the same. Be careful with that. If you use a mechanical engraver, typically that top cap layer is much thicker. It's designed for a router bit, uh, even though visually it doesn't look much different unless you look at that cap layer, um, it, but it can perform totally different on the laser system. So you want to make sure that you have a laser bowl ready. It's going to be outside that it's uv stable if it's going to be inside um, it doesn't matter you can use the uv version or the non-uv version it can also flare up when cutting um, so you want to make sure that especially on the thicker versions of it that you pay very close attention to it when cutting the material um, i do recommend masking it or coating it for best cut quality especially on the thick uh, versions um, you can use the soap trick that i showed you especially on like the texture materials that are hard to mask Laser cut edges on this material will remain tacky or sticky for up to 48 hours. This is normal. 
Um, and so you want to make sure you just understand that. That will go away, the tacky, sticky, as well as, of course, the smell. Just like any plastic, I've covered that on all the other plastics. The, the increased smell will be, um, again, it'll dissipate after a few days, as well as the tacky edges. Um, you can also produce some surface staining when cutting and marking on some colors and some brands, which we're going to get into as well. This does not take a lot of laser power. Um, I've actually done it on 10 watt lasers in the past, but 30 watts is recommended in order to use the full speed range of most laser systems at least. Um, it, it can handle high resolution up to 500 DPI is recommended because you can handle the fine details um, without losing any clarity. Air assist with the large nozzle. I do suggest the large nozzle. If you use the small nozzle, um, it can actually cause some problems. We'll get into next. Um, masking may be necessary for cutting, especially some thicknesses and some colors. Um, when you have a color core of a white surface with a red core, for example, you're going to get a lot of haze and stain when cutting this material. And so typically I like to mask it or put the soap onto the surface of it when I'm cutting it because it can stain the surface. Cutting table, of course, is recommended for cutting it. Standard two inch lens is the most commonly used lens uh, for cutting, engraving, and marking this material. Uh, other lenses, of course, will work as well, uh, but the two inch is most, the most common. When engraving the material, the wide mouth uh, cone is highly recommended. Otherwise, it actually causes the flow to actually cause the uh, to material to cool too quickly will produce a residue to start forming. And so the wide mouth cone, you can see the difference. This is untouched out of the laser system, just using the two cones side by side. You can see the Trotec with the wide mouth cone is nice and clean, right out of the laser system, smooth, clean, concise. And the small mouth high pressure cone directing onto it, you can see the debris and residue that's forming on it. Same settings, no difference between the two besides the cone. So if you are seeing a lot of residue and debris, it's probably because you're using too much air pressure um, and or you're also using a, a cone that's directing too much air pressure down onto it. If you don't have a wide mouth cone, reduce the amount of air pressure. Uh, or if you're not engraving it um, or if you're not cutting it, take your cone off and shut your air off entirely. That will work just as well. So make sure not to overpower the air assist when engraving uh, or use the wide mouth cone for a much cleaner response. When engraving this material, um, you tend to see a little bit of kind of striations or engraving lines. And so you can actually, there's a lot of tricks on defocusing it a little bit and that's gonna give you a smoother background pattern. Um, and you can uh, you can defocus it up to 80 thousandths of an inch or 0.08 um, or, you know, be uh, so 80 to, to to even more, over a quarter of an inch. So depending on how far out of focus you're gonna get, um, this will smooth out your edges, but it will also lose some detail if you're gonna do that. So if you're doing very large signage, um, you can run at lower resolutions and take it out of focus. You're gonna get a broader beam, smoother background, um, but your edge quality or your detail will be reduced a little bit, but it will reduce the, the grooves that form into the surface of the laser producing a smoother finish. Uh, wider focal lengths or longer lenses will do the same thing than taking it out of focus. You can use that as well. Um, but for intricate engraving, such as, you know, six point font or smaller or very small font, um, I don't suggest taking it out of focus at all. So play around with focus. If you do see uh, residue or not residue, but um, uh, lines and patterns that tend to start forming, you can play with focus a little bit and really uh, effectively get a nicer finished look on the surface of the material itself. For cutting it, of course, the table and vacuum is recommended. Um, for the cutting it, cover the surfaces to produce uh, vacuum. Uh, if I cover the rest of the cutting table, except for the area that's covered with the, the laminated uh, engraving plastic, then it's gonna create a vacuum and kind of hold it flat. Sometimes this material, especially if it's stored improperly, can be warped. Um, and so a vacuum table will kind of allow you to cut through it as well as hold it in place. And so you want to make sure to keep it and store it flat on its uh, not on its side or at an angle or something like that, because it can actually distort the plastic over time. And a vacuum table will keep that from happening. Um, engraving direction is another way to uh, improve the quality, changing it from the direction from the top down engraving to the bottom up engraving. Um, this will engrave the areas, the area that's not been engraved, the fumes will go over the top and it doesn't allow any excess residue layer to be uh, 
captured into the engraved area or the fresh engraved area. So little tricks to improve engraving process. Um, and you can see the difference here. And so here's an example of this little winery uh, engraving, engraved in some burgundy or wine color um, trolleys plastic with a white core. So the material works very well. You start engraving it and this is running at a lower 333 DPI resolution. And as you can see, the laser will lightly engrave into the surface, exposing that core of the material to produce that nice high contrast mark. Um, and that's the adva advantage of this material. Intricate detail, high contrast, uh, detailed engraving into the surface that can also be cuttable um, if you want it to look metallic, if you have a, something like, you know, a winery type where you want that burgundy look and color contrast, you can get those materials to match that. So that's the, the, the uh, advantage of this material. It works very, very easy. Um, there's real no new process. The thinner materials I can cut out, a little bit of residue uh, that forms on the surface, uh, simple little cloth over the surface, you can wipe that right off. Um, if you overpower it or if, uh, or if you use the wide mouth cone, some of that staining or the, the dust will, of course, be reduced as well. So there we finished. We got a nice white back core and we have a burgundy surface into an intricate, detailed, large sign, which is probably the most common application for this material. Now, cutting the material is very simple, and probably one of the more popular cutting applications is your ADA sign. ADA material, you can buy this stuff that is, does not have a core color. In this case, this is a white ADA and a blue ADA, which tends to be a specific thickness. And so here's a common ADA sign created with the ADA uh, uh, engraving plastic. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel one color and I'm going to place it over the top of another color. I'm gonna leave the film onto the surface of the, the top here, uh, the clear film, and then I'm gonna convert my file to an outline. And I'm gonna tune my laser to cut through one layer and then both layers. So the lettering here is gonna be cut with kiss cut, or we're cutting through just that top layer of ADA. And then I'm cutting the outline or the outline cut to cut through both layers. Once we're finished, we can then just grab it and peel up the excess material. And this is how we can make an ADA sign with your laser system using the ADA plastic. So as long as it's not pressed too much and you, you're able to peel it quickly after you pull it out of the laser, um, we'll tool the little ADA dots here. And I'm gonna place a piece of uh, double-sided tape to, to make sure the little braille dots are held in place. And we have now basically created an ADA sign. We'll pick off any of the excess little parts here. And this entire sign took just over five minutes from design on the screen to cutting out, to assembling, to put together, uh, to cleaning. So very, very quick method of creating a ADA sign. And then I'll just take a dry cloth to peel off any of the extra films, which is gonna clean up any residue and staining on the surface. Then I'm gonna use the Accent Signage Braille Raster Pen. Uh, when Here's a scan QR code if you're interested in that. And then I'm gonna just plunge in to the laser cut holes using just a standard braille font at 20 point to create the, the braille cut lines. And then I'm gonna just plunge that, uh, the braille raster beads down into the holes to create my braille. So this is how simple this material is to cut. And you know, we can just cut a sign out like the, the, the burgundy wine sign we did, but this is a more intricate detailed cut that has been cut with the ADA plastic of the, the, uh, the, the this laser bowl microsurfaced or uh, engraving plastic. Um, whether it's a solid core color like this or a two layer color, um, it cuts exceptionally well. And this is a great application that is commonly used for this type of material. Um, there are a few processing tips, of course, when engraving it, um, cleaning it with uh, uh, a lint-free cloth, uh, to wipe away any residues and debris. You wanna um, um, try uh, using an alcohol-free cleaner like hexanes. Again, just like the the acrylic I showed at first, do not use alcohol-based cleaners because as I said before, alcohol or acrylic is a component of the type of plastic being used on this. And so if you clean it with an alcohol-based product, over time, you're gonna actually see little micro fixtures and fractures start to forming in your engraving and your cutting. If you're using paint fill with this material, again, do not use alcohol-based paints. Stay away from them, use an acrylic-based paint. Um, use a, a, an oil-based paint, any other types of paint or a water-based. Those are all to do. And if you do want to clean it, heptane, uh, the heptane material uh, or hexanes work exceptionally well. So here's one where I engraved 
extra powerful with a small mouth nose, nozzle cone on purpose just to show you how the hexanes work. Hexanes work extremely well with this material. I do suggest wearing gloves with this material. Um, it's like it's like gasoline, so you don't want to put it on your hands and stay away from the, and make sure you're in a well-ventilated area. Make sure to read all the hazards of the material. Um, and then just take a little bit of it and it will dramatically clean out all this residue. Um, no other cleaner I have found over the years does as well as this material as heptane or hexanes. Um, lighter fluid worked pretty well, but not as well as these materials. And so very quick, easy uh, cleaning method to clean out those types of materials. Um, and that's just a, a nice yellow or black core with a yellow surface, um, lighter materials. So here's a nice overpowered, again, I overpowered it on purpose. But this shows you how the hexanes will allow you to save that. No other cleaner will do that. So this is a great laser hack that I have found over the years working with a chemist to find the best possible solution. Now, of course, you don't want to dwell the material. It is a solvent based, but as long as you wipe over the surface, it will not damage the acrylic. And over 15 years, I've never seen a sign or a product that has been used with this have any issues or concern or problems after the hexanes have been used. So it's been proven and confirmed. Um, here is the QR code again. Again, it doesn't ship in California. I apologize. And there's nothing I can really do. There's a local law about that. Um, but you want to find it locally, if that's the case. Anyone else, you can go to uh, McMaster. I have also found it on Amazon, uh, but it is considerably more expensive. A gallon of it was like $23 for the hexanes. Heptane uh, was about the same price, but it was only for a quart. So it is a little more expensive. But the heptane is another alternative that works exactly as well. The next one here is on this laser plastic, when you have the blacks especially, and you want to get the blacks blacker. Um, some brands of this plastic, you tend to, because we're distorting the background and we're not, we don't get as clean, sometimes you get a grayish response. I have found that coconut oil, believe it or not, works exceptionally well and it has inept properties that really, really darken it. And even after a year, side by side, um, the when you rub coconut oil down into a plastic that has a black background, I tend to get a darker response. And so if you tend to see a, a, a grayish response or you didn't take it out of focus or use the right cone and you get a grayish response uh, on some plastics, that's a great way to kind of bring that black back out of the um, of the plastic itself uh, quickly and easily. And the other nice thing is the coconut oil really does uh, improve the smell. So a, a definite bonus. Color sensitivity, this is a problem that has really kind of faded away. Um, a lot of the brands like the Trolleys plastics, and I know Gemini no longer have this problem. Romark has uh, a lot of their versions now no longer have this problem. But in the past, I've dealt with this for years. Some brands actually will not remove the entire surface of the material when engraving certain colors, believe it or not. And this was found and explained to me by a physicist that explained that the color red actually sometimes doesn't absorb the infrared spectrum of a CO2 laser because their infrared in spectrum of light, the color visible spectrum of red acts more like a lens than a color and we're not able to get a clean removal. So no matter what setting you do, uh, when you're engraving a red material, you'll find a pinkish hue. Um, in this case, there's only one really effective way to fix this, and that is to run a second laser pass. Um, cleaning hexanes, nothing really solves that problem. Uh, most of the plastic manufacturers, including the Trolleys, has gone away from using the spectrums that cause this problem, but there are still some of them out there that have caused this problem. Blues can also cause this problem, reds and blues. Um, I've had the same problem on anodized aluminum. I've had it on painted metals. So it's not exclusive to plastics. But if you come across this, there's really only one way to do it, and that is to make sure that you hit it with a second pass. Um, if you order a plastic that tends to do this a lot and use the color, make sure to charge appropriately because it's going to take more time or find some different brands that don't do that. Um, this is a problem that is going away. Um, but in the 20 years I've been doing laser engraving, this has always kind of been a, a plague uh, on the color red working with infrared lasers, which caused the spectrum not to quite engrave it away. So this is a common issue, again, not for just the engraving plastic, but also for any color red engraving off of any material in a lot of cases, or, or some color reds, I should say, not all of them, because that, that problem is, uh, it is something that is uh, uh, becoming a distant memory. 
Trolay's plastic, of course, makes all different versions of it. Um, here's the paint fill version you can see in the center here, which is nice, where you can engrave away, produces a pocket, paint it on the back, flip it over to produce the contrast. Um, Trotec makes the Trolay's, the Trolay's Metallics, the Metallic Plus, which is your outdoor, the Reverse, which is the paint fill stuff which you see in the center here. Um, the thin materials, the sticker materials, Premier Thins, the ADA signage material, textured materials, which are going to handle more um, greasy grime. It's going to be scratch resistance, UV stable outdoor, um, which is the textures, which is tend to use it's fingerprint resistant, um, the ultimates, mats, satins. So here's a QR code. If you are looking for a source for this material, again, all the sets, uh, the, uh, the, uh, presets and material programs are profiled in the materials database for the Trolase plastics. Okay. Moving on to the next thin film material, uh, PETG is a great material to also work with. PETG is a your thin film materials. Thin film is your, um, it's also known as mylar. Uh, PET, PETG is a great material to work with because it is going to be great for all different types of applications. PET is short for uh, polyethylene terephthalate. terephthalate. Uh, the chemical is named, basically a name for polyester. It's a strong, clean, lightweight plastic that's widely used applications worldwide, also known as the brand name Mylar. Uh, PETG is also adding the glycol. Glycol makes it a little bit more flexible. And so either one of them is gonna respond the same. The reason this is popular is because of PPE, protective uh, equipment, uh, lately has been extremely popular with this material. You can see the face shield that is on the screen here. This material has become extremely popular and works very, very well with the laser system itself. And so it is a good, good byproduct and because we can process it so quickly. Um, doesn't take much laser wattage. I do suggest air assist. If you're cutting it, use your cutting table with a vacuum uh, because this stuff tends to come in sheets and rolls. And it can, uh, when you bite in a roll, it really likes to flip, uh, like keep the the memory of that roll. And so a vacuum table um, or a cutting table with the downdraft vacuum, as long as you cover up the excess area, will keep it flat. Standard two inch lens, nothing really special uh, in processing this material itself. It's commonly used for film cutting, P P uh, protective uh, equipment, face shields, food storage, packaging, visual merchandising, engineering plastic, displays, as well as stencils, very common for stencils, especially on the laser industry. Um, advantages is that it cuts extremely fast and clean with the laser. Clear flame polished cut edges. Um, it can be cut with a CO2 laser for a uh, watermark, almost opaque finish. Um, but it does scratch easily and it does produce low contrast engraving. The one advantage is mechanical cutting of this machine can cause this, it can cause micro fractures. It's difficult to cut it with a blade where a laser, um, and I'm going to show you a video here and it happens quickly. This is live. This is not sped up. That's how fast we can cut this material. So that's 120 watt at 20% speed. I'm able to cut through um, 0 0.007 inch thick um, material that quickly. And so the material cuts exceptionally fast. We get a clean, concise cut um, onto the material with, with the uh, laser system. There's no damage that comes from, say, mechanical engravers and so, or mechanical cutting methods. And so the laser produces by far the best method of cutting this material. So that's why it's more, it's, it's very advantageous material to process with. Now engraving it, the contrast can be low. Um, you can see here engraving side by side. If you engrave it just as black, you get an opaque image. Uh, my suggest is to convert the image to 60% grayscale um, and you get a refraction of the eye and it really does give you a frosted effect in this material. Um, and so I get a lot of requests. It's like, I need contrast, it needs to be legible. The opaque transparency that comes when you engrave black looks okay, but it's not near, it doesn't stand out like uh, almost like acrylic. And so running at 60% black, really does make it stand out. And the first material uh, uh, extruded acrylic, I kind of showed that as well. If you run a grayscale on extruded acrylic, you can also get this kind of effect. Now there is a little bit of a patterning in the back um, and you can run like a 70% or an 80% grayscale and it'll help that a little bit, um, but it doesn't refract the light as well. So I will add a black outline around the characters. So you can see the Trotec logo has a black outline here 
with a with a gray or a 60% grayscale fill. And that's the difference. So when you're engraving this stuff, if you want to run it with a grayscale, so here's an example of running with a little bit of grayscale logo onto the surface. And this is a multi-layer material here, uh, PET material that's used for like graffiti shields. And so this was an example that showcases the ability to cut multiple layers and then each layer can be peeled off. So this is a great material. The hexanes work exceptionally well for cleaning this. And so if there is not a thin film or a protective layer on it, you can wipe it with the hexanes and any staining or residue gives you that nice clean, right out of the laser clean look. And that's where the hexanes come in. So great looking. Again, this is a pretty small piece. And so you can start to see the pixelations from the engraving. The detail is not great on the engraving, but it is legible. Hexanes, again, great plastic cleaner, all of the above. Really, it doesn't matter what kind of plastic it is. This is the kind of cleaner you want to use. Um, since there are no presets in the materials and it is a product that Trotec now sells, um, here are some common parameters for the PET plastic film um, for the Speedy 360 uh, and 380 watt, as well as the Speedy 400, uh, 120 watt. And so if you're just cutting the material, it cuts extremely fast. Um, it's a great material to work with. Um, and here's some parameters so that uh, if you are interested in running it, you can um, you can copy these settings. Here's some other resources, uh, video tutorial on the face shields. The face shields have been very popular. You can go to the Trotec YouTube uh, web channel um, and you can watch most of these. The video tutorials will show you how to do it as well as give you the graphic design to create these face shields. Uh, and, and of course, here's a QR code to order the materials if you don't have a source already. Trotec does sell uh, PPE materials now. Uh, because of the COVID, everybody wanted to get in on it right away. And it was a great alternative to some of the other products and, and industries that kind of dropped away. Some of the awards and trophies and stuff that were no longer being needed because so many things were clo closed during the, the COVID crisis. Uh, a lot of companies have kind of switched over to creating these type of protective equipment. So we have provided that material so that you have the access to getting that material for your laser, as well as parameters and settings. Okay, uh, last uh, material we're going to cover here today is the Delrin material. Um, Delron material is the polyoxymethylene. Um, it is a, or also known as POM. It basically, it's DuPont's Delrin is the first brand that actually developed it. Delrin has kind of become the the the, the, the coined term for it, even though it is a, a brand name. Um, DuPont created it back uh, in the 50s and 60s, I believe. Um, but it is a material that works exceptionally well with the laser. Um, it has the, the stability and quality of acrylic for edge quality, but the strength and durability of ABS. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, and so you, you can, you know, it cannot be broken. It can't be stretched, um, but it's also UV stable. So it's a great material to work with the material. Um, it is ideal from working uh, material in parts designed to replace metal because it is that strong. It combines low friction and high wear resistance with a high strength and stiffness that some applications require. If you are looking for the most durable plastic that can be laser cut to replace something like metal and is still cuttable, this is the plastic you want to work with. Um, it's highly stable for uh, uh, suitable for laser cutting and engraving um, because it can be, e be easily removed by the laser beam. A high fatigue resistance, creep resistance, toughness, tensile strength, and stiffness. Um, it engraves thinner, lighter part design um, and offers potential for reducing part production cost. It is ideal for uh, prototyping. Um, R&D and engineering tend to use this plastics for building structures for um, automation for mo motions and stuff like that because it can be cut into so many different shapes and sizes and it's so ridiculously strong compared to other plastics. So for example, the gear here that's engraved, gears, um, safety restraints components, door system components, uh, conveyor components, medical services, ski bindings, ski fasteners, zip, zip fasteners, um, stamps and seals is one of the things that we tend to do a lot. But as you can see here from this gear that was cut out, this is right out of the laser. It's clean, it's concise. 
um, it is it is a beautiful material to work with. Um, advantages on the laser, it can cut up to three eighths inch thick. Um, unlike ABS, we can cut thicker material. It does take a lot of laser power. I do suggest high laser power um, for that thickness. I would say about 120 watts for that thickness. Um, 60 watts or so for cutting uh, eighth of an inch, about, a, about 80 watts, I would say to a quarter of an inch. Um, can be laser engraved with CO2 to produce and produce depth. Uh, fiber laser will produce contrast marks with outstanding contrast, kind of like the ABS, especially, uh, but only on the black material in this case. Um, and it's strong and extreme and UV stable, and it's a self lubricating plastic. So any type of component that's going to bind or grind or, or slide together, um, this is the plastic you want to use. The, the limitations from the CO2, from the laser standpoint, is that it is low contrast laser marks. Um, it does require high um, laser power, and masking is recommended for cutting um, because it does produce a little bit of debris and residue, and it can be flammable when you cut it. So we do want to mask it as well and keep close attention and use air assist when processing it. So 60 watts plus is what I recommend for most of it, using the small nozzle on the air assist. Uh, masking for in deep engraving and or cutting. Um, cutting table and a standard two inch lens is, is recommended for processing this material. Uh, engraving contrast, you can see with deep engraving onto the black, we can see it better. Light engraving is definitely not as noticeable, but it is subtle and it is still clean and sharp. Um, white material, as you see here, is also very low, low contrast. And so contrast is something for again, like the ABS, it's not gonna produce like barcode readability, but it is still going to be good enough for logos and graphics and verbiage and stuff that is put into components and parts. So engraving it, I typically will mask it because it does produce a haze or a stain or a residue uh, for the deep engraving. For light engraving, I don't need to do this. You can just engrave it normal, but any of the staining and residue, excuse me, that comes into it, from the cutting process or the engraving process will do that. And you can see the edge quality is stunning. Um, it's right up there with acrylic when it comes to cutting ability. Um, and this is a three millimeter or, or eighth of an inch uh, or tenth or an eighth of an inch thick uh, cut piece. You will see a little bit of patterning that forms in the background uh, from the strokes of the laser as the material tends to kind of re-solidify and remelt. Um, you can go over it with a little bit out of focus if you want to reduce that, but that is a byproduct of engraving depth in it. But it's very similar to acrylic in, it, in its response in that area. Cutting it is outstanding. Um, it is going to handle more detail and more consistent detail than any other plastic that there is. Um, we've never come across another plastic that can handle this much cutting detail. So this is an intricate little pattern that's been cut. Um, in this case, I'm cutting it from the back side. And then once I pull it out of the machine, the difference is, is if this was acrylic, the parts would break if I were to flex them or twist them. I could literally wrench on this thing and twist it and it's not gonna damage, it's not gonna come apart. The masking can quickly and easily pull, pull the part and the parts can very quickly be popped out. Um, the backside, of course, I mask as well. Um, removing the mask is usually pretty easy because it is self-lubricating plastic. Once you're finished, you get that nice, clean, concise, high detailed cutting. Um, and here's the real advantage of this material is we have the ability to cut and maintain exceptional detail. If I were to cut this kind of detail out of acrylic, the excess heat would go into the material and all these little pieces would be distorted. If not, it would probably have just started on fire. Um, ABS material, the same thing. I would have just been, it would have been distorted. We wouldn't get those nice, clean, sharp, crisp uh, bars down the edge of this thickness of, of Delrin plastic. So if you are looking for intricate detail, very, very strong plastic that can hold the detail when cutting intricate detail, that's very, very strong and very, very engravable, Delrin is the plastic that you want to use. Um, another very popular application for this type of material is the seals. Um, because it is so strong and it is self-lubricating, Delrun seals are an extremely popular application for the laser. Um, combined with an embossing presses used for notaries, companies, engineers, government agencies, you when you want to add relief uh, or to to like paper and documents um, for fraudulent protection, this the laser system gives you that ability. And if you want to watch the process of how to do that, basically what you do is you create a positive and a negative, um, and then it's put into an embossing press um, in the right shape, and then it's pressed over the surface of paper 
um, and then it embosses that graphic into it. Here's a, a great little video that Trotech Canada put together. If you want to scan this QR code and they can walk, they'll walk you through the process, give you a file and allow you to play with it as well. Um, Mopa laser on black will produce a stunning effect onto black um, Delrin plastic, only black. Um, unlike ABS, we can't, we don't get that, that white or grayish response. The other effect is because the heat is absorbed from the, the Mopa fiber laser, we actually get a foaming effect. The foaming effect means that the engraved areas from the fiber laser actually raise up. So when you run your finger over the top of, say, the, the QR code here, you can actually feel it. So unlike CO2 engraving, which engraves down into it, the, the fiber laser not only gives you the contrast, it actually can raise the surface of the character slightly and it will pop out. And so it's a, it's a great effect if you are looking for high contrast without doing any type of um, uh, other method. Now, the other problem too is because it is a self-lubricating plastic, you can't really color fill this material. Color filling the plastics, um, most plastics you can mask it, you can color fill it, but not a lot of paint likes to stick into this material. It's uh, it's like a Teflon almost in the fact that paint likes to just flake right off of it. So I've not had a lot of luck color filling this material. So if you do need high contrast on the dark material, your fiber laser is your best choice. Um, if you do need it engraving it, just engrave it with more depth to produce what contrast you can. Lighter colors, um, like your whites and stuff, you know, it's hard to find Delrin in multiple colors. Uh, most of the time, it's either white or black. That's usually most, most choices. McMaster Car is also the support uh, supplier to what I would use uh, to order this material. So Trotec sells a lot of the materials we've been covering today. Um, here is the Trotec USA website for the engraving-supplies.com. This is our site for materials for laserable supplies, which we cover the, the engraving plastic um, or the laminate plastics as well as the acrylic plastics. So if you are interested in going to that site, here's a QR code for that. Um, Trotec is uh, nice because we actually create the materials that work with our database. So they're, they're specifically designed for lasers. Um, you're gonna have application support from a Trotec manufacturer uh, or su support location on those materials, 24 seven easy ordering on our website, um, R&D focused on better performance specifically for lasers. So the advantage of having a company that supplies the materials um, and of course, lots of different materials work with the laser system, but buying the materials directly from Trotec are going to guarantee the results on your Trotec, which is a definite advantage. Um, we dis uh, distribute all across the country. Um, Typically, UPS ground within one to two business days based on the geographic location. Um, we have four different locations for distribution across the United States. Um, free shipping on orders of over $300, unless you're in Alaska and Hawaii, which is a $500 minimum order, um, which will ship out of the New Jersey office, which is our, our main headquarters. Um, the other benefit is, of course, material parameters. Um, there are preset material parameters right on our, uh, our material websites. Um, and so you can go to the material supplier website and uh, the same site, you can actually go in and you can download it. So if you, we have a new material on there and you have an old driver, you can actually go on and find the parameters, which are going to give you your preset for the material by selecting the Trotec laser that you own the laser power that you're running, and then you can actually pick the parameter for that and then download it directly into your driver and immediately have all the preset settings anytime you use those materials. So definite clear advantage if you own a Trotec. Um, if you use the Trotec parameter or materials, the parameters are preset for you, but just makes the entire process easier. We also have business support um, um, and display options for your customers. And so if you have a customer that wants to see different colors, we offer sample binders. And so you can actually see, touch and feel all the different color options. Um, this is great for you uh, if you're running a shop that tends to offer a lot of choices. Uh, if someone comes in and wants a different color, you can actually pull the binder out and then pick the right color for the right situation. If it's a certain color swatch that you need for a specific colored sign or a, a corporate logo, uh, you can find the one that's going to best match that, touch it, feel it, um, uh, and then and then reproduce it and then order the exact material. And so these uh, sample binders are $120. Um, 
and no charge for product pages if you want to, uh, but you can call to order them as more materials come out. And then swatch fans on, say, like the acrylics or specific ones. So if you just deal with the metallics, for example, you can contact any of our material account executives and order. There's a phone number and, again, the website to go forward and, and, uh, and run that. We also do sizing and cut. So that if you're running, say, a Rayjet 50, you, we're going to cut the sizes down for you to the 12 by 16 to fit your laser system. Uh, Speedy 100, um, the Speedy 360, 300, as well as the 400, we can cut them so that you make certain that you have the right sheet size prior to ordering it for your machine. So not all companies will do that. Another advantage of uh, supplying the materials with the laser systems itself. Um, we do have a deal of the month, um, continued from last month or October deal in the month is free shipping when you spend more than $25 on any Trotec materials. Um, can't be combined with other, any other offers, um, can only be redeemed within the USA throughout the month of October. Um, some exclusions do apply. I just use voucher code SEPT-PROMO-2020 uh, when ordering. Um, if you missed last month, last month's very, very popular application teeth or uh, third Thursday seminar was on Corel Draw. It will be live today so that it is now public and no longer uh, private. So if you want to scan this QR code, it will take you to the Corel Draw basics and laser compatibility that we covered last month. It was a very popular um, uh, seminar and uh, have had a lot of requests for doing future ones. And so uh, early next year or mid next year, we'll definitely be doing more advanced traded uh, Corel Draw courses on this seminar course. All right. Well, that was a long one. I apologize. It took a while. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to kick in here with Alan uh, and we will move forward with our question section. Hi, hey, Alan. everybody. Welcome. I'm good. Of course, I, I'm going to get hoarse after after that. As I, I mean, we're pushing what an hour and forty minutes for that. That was mm -hmm. a long one. Um, so lots of good content, lots of good plastic to play with, um, and uh, hopefully we we helped a lot of people provide uh, some answers to those plastic questions. Yep. All right. Well, uh, Alan is our consumables manager. He's the one that is in charge of working with our um, all those different plastics. And so he's definitely got a clear advantage of understanding the different plastics and, uh, and all the different materials that Trotec sells. And so between he and I, we can definitely answer any of the questions that you may have. He may have already answered a few of your questions online, um, but some of the more complex ones we will definitely answer now. So yeah. let's get started here. Wow, what a great point. There's a standard melting point for plastics that you want to stay above for the smooth edge. Acrylic at 320 is good, but should we assume above 200 or 250? Um, as I kind of stated on plastics, there's really no assumption. It really depends on your tolerance of what you deem acceptable. Um, lower temperatures definitely will produce less desirable results. But in some cases, there's no other methods of doing it that produce better results. So it really is kind of your tolerance. I've cut much even lower temperatures and it's still acceptable. So I, I wouldn't call it a specific temperature range because it is personal preference. If you don't mm -hmm. want any melted effect, yeah, I, I definitely say, you know, anything past the 250 mark, you're going to start to see less of that effect and, and kind of have a good understanding that the plastic is going to work better for you. Um, are you familiar with this one at all, uh, uh, Alan? Um, no, I would just say the same thing. I mean, there's there's cutting and then there's cutting. If you're looking for cutting with a finished perfect edge, um, yeah, I would say, you know, 250 would be the minimum. Anything more than that, <clears throat> you're going to get some expansion and stuff. But if you don't need a perfect edge, I mean, I think one of the questions is cutting polycarbonate. And yeah. um, polycarbonate cuts with a laser, it turns brown. Um, if your edge is going to be visible, then laser might not be the right way. If your edge is going to be in behind a bezel or something like that, then it's a perfectly good um, method of cutting it. So it really... Yeah. It really depends on on the application, what you require for your edge quality. Agreed. Um, and that, yeah. and it is, it's personal preference. And and so many people are like, well, what's good, what's bad? And, and it's mm -hmm. in the eye of the beholder is what it comes down to. Exactly. 
All right. What can you tell me about laser ablation for bonding preparation, specifically to prepare for a carbon fiber epoxy service? Uh, that's that's not really one that I have come across for bonding preparation. Um, Alan, you familiar with this type of question? Um, a little bit, but um, we need to get a little bit more specific. I mean, there are people that will use the laser to just take um, – if in in other materials it's called a mill glaze basically some materials when they come through the extruder or the rollers it puts a bit of a glossy kind of finish on it and uh, you can use the laser to just basically take that off um you can also use the laser in uh like a 60 percent or 50 percent grayscale image to roughen up a surface you'll you'll end up with a with like little bumps in the surface yeah. and um and that'll help glue sometimes if you're using like an epoxy glue um sometimes what you're looking for is is more um you know more glue being able to be held in there instead of just pushing out yeah and so that can surface is that can help with that. that yeah so that's Without knowing more about the exact application, it's hard to say, but um, it yeah. should be possible. Yeah. Yeah. I can't see why that wouldn't be possible just to rough it up. I mean, mostly the time that just simple sandpaper is used because mm. if it's going to be covered anyway, it's a much faster method of doing that. Um, yeah. But if it is localized and specific, yeah, the laser could be a definite advantage. Yeah. You can also use the laser to put a little bit of a, of a, a notch that's not really the word but if you, to inset other pieces yeah if you if you wanted to get better uh, adhesion too i'm working uh, on a kevlar engraving project and i need to uh, work in defocus modes to change the z position of the table i was wondering how does the spot size change when i change the z position of the table um that is a, a great question and and i do get that one a lot the Z position is, uh, you know, the, the, the spot size is going to change based on the Z position, but this is going to heavily depend on what lens you're using. And so what, what I suggest is based on what lens you're using, um, what I would suggest is fire the laser. Um, you take it out of focus, say a tenth of an inch and fire the laser into the material and you can measure it. Um, and then go a little bit further out and it's going to measure it. Because not only does it depend on how far focus you are, but what power you're using um, and also the reaction on the material itself. You, know, you can actually have uh, excess heat absorption into the material. So you tend to get more of a plume effect into the material. So this is going to take some trial and error depending on what lens, what material and what power setting you're going to use. Um, that hourglass effect that comes on lenses varies a little bit um, based on all those different parameters. So um, there's no real formula that I can give you off the top of my head without just saying you need to do some trial and error on that. What wattage would I need to cut and flame polish three quarters of inch acrylic? Um, Alan, probably uh, you want to cover this one? I could definitely well, do <laughs> More. More, um, yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the quick answer. Uh, I think you used the formula that you want uh, 10 watts of power for every uh, millimeter of acrylic. So three-quarter three quarter acrylic is basically 20 millimeters. So you, you'd want 200 watts. Yeah, but, theoretically. Yeah, theoretically, but uh, I think you did three quarter in in one of your demonstrations in the video with an eighty watt. Yeah. So I mean, it it can be done. It's not optimal. Um, basically, what happens is the 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 slower you have to cut through it, the more heat you're going to get building up in the acrylic, and the more likely it is to flame. Yeah, and it's also power versus time. Yeah. So higher wattage, um, and, and you may have noticed on, say, that gear, the edge quality wasn't as good as, say, the half-inch thick material. Because as we have to slow more and more down um, to get through in that one pass and focus into it, the quality does start to suffer. So higher wattages, the more wattage you can afford, the, the better. I would suggest three-quarters of an inch, at, you know, at the very minimum, 120 watts. But if you can afford more, and this is something mm -hmm. you're doing often, more better definitely the case um mm -hmm. definitely po power is going to be your friend when it comes to thickness of cutting uh, for any decent type of productivity especially and quality mm. can you cut low quantity pvc sheets 
with a good fume system. <laughs> you can. <laughs> but you, you can do anything. Image. Yeah, you saw the image of that laser system. Uh, mm -hmm. I do tell people that if you do one or two, it's not going to really cause damage. It, it's an accumulation over time, but do so at your own risk. Um, it mm -hmm. is extremely corrosive byproduct that will damage your machine. Um, you saw the, set, the the photo that I posted on there. Um, the, the answer is yes, it will cut it, but you do so at your own peril and your own risk and at the, at the actual damage to your laser system. Yeah. I once saw somebody who cut a few pieces of PVC and a week later, every exposed screw in their machine was rusted. Yep, it doesn't take it's, much. To it's start. amazing how fast it happens. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I would definitely not risk it. It's a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, find a plastic that is uh, going to be an alternative. How does polycarbonate uh, cut on the laser? And this is probably the one you saw there, there Alan. Uh, mm -hmm. Polycarbonate, and that's one I was actually thinking of covering in my next course um, because polycarbonate is, it's a carbon-based plastic. Um, it cuts okay, but it is going to produce, because it has carbon in it, your edges are going to be sooty black. There's no avoiding it. Um, it cuts okay. You do want a mask on both sides. You want to use air assist and the edge quality is something you're not going to like. So if it's not going to be seen, the edge quality is not going to be seen. If it's going to be used in a panel or something like that, it can cut. But if the edge quality is something that is necessary, I would suggest, uh, to use mechanical cutting methods. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to be sanding the edges. Yeah. And, and again, you're using a mechanical method to clean up the laser. So yeah. it's counterproductive to use a laser if the edge quality is going to be seen, but it does a good job cutting it. It's precise. It's quality. It's just the edges are going to be pure black because it's, it's pulling the carbon out of the material. Plus the word polycarbonate. It is a carbon based plastic. Is the acrylic cutting grid available for a speedy 100? I believe so. That is a question I don't think I've ever uh, asked, but I, um, right now I think that it is available only on the 300 and up. Um, but you know, if you were to buy, um, typically the, what it does is it sets on top of the existing cutting table. So you could buy the larger 300 and then you can cut it down if you wanted to. I don't think that it comes specifically for the 100 now that I, now that I think about it, um, uh, because that, that system doesn't use the, the multi-table uh, concept that the 300 or the 360 and the 400 uses. Um, the 300 only uses three tables, um, where the 360 and the 400 use, uh, seven or six or seven tables. So, um, but that, that doesn't mean you can't use one or cut it down, um, you know, for, uh, for your 100 and set it on top of your existing table and it would work just fine. Mm -hmm. You can also get the plastic lighting grids from like Home Depot. Yeah, I've done that as well. If, if, if you don't have, if there isn't a specific one for your machine, yeah, you can always just get those and they're disposable basically. Yeah. What do you uh, use for brush um, on the, for the bristle material? Uh, for uh, Probably when I was doing the acrylic. I mean, it depends on how abrasive you want. Um, believe it or not, on the acrylic, I was using a brass wire brush. Um, you can use just a bristle brush if you want, um, but a brass really gets down in, especially I don't care that it's going to frost it because I'm going to glaze it afterwards. Um, and the more great, uh, aggressive you get with it, the more debris it pulls out. You can use a wire brush. You can use a, a I use a brass brush because it's not as abrasive. Um, but if it's going to scratch or if you need to protect in, any areas that is not engraved, then you don't want to use that. You want to use just a soft nylon toothbrush type stuff. Yeah. Um, the hard, harder bristles, the better. Um, it's going to kind of yeah. pull the debris out. I've always just used my old toothbrushes. Your, your old toothbrush, yeah. Or the, your current ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. I'm having a hard time with uh, engraving the Trillase Metallic Plus brushed copper and black using an epilogue fusion. Um, having a hard time. Oh, it continues. To take it out of focus and sometimes get a vertical looking banding. Any suggestions with 120 watt to get that smooth uh, looking black color? Uh, on the second layer. Uh, Alan, probably a good one for you since you're the, our material expert. Yes, what you are seeing is uh, basically a heat effect. When you get vertical banding in, in the plastic, it's a heat effect. And it's, it's a combination of how the material absorbs the heat and also how your laser is putting the heat into it. Um, when your laser is, is moving at a particular speed, 
and it's pulsing at a particular rate, the math doesn't always work out. So you don't get exactly identical spaces between the the, the pulses. And um, you you can sometimes in, in the plastic, you can sometimes see that. Um, what I would suggest, the, the best way to get rid of that, the other thing is um, that it's typically, I'm assuming you're doing large areas of, of engraving uh, because you wouldn't see it if it's just small letters. But if you're doing large areas of engraving, the best uh, solution I've ever found for that is to change your artwork from black to 60 or 70% gray. And basically what will happen is your laser will half tone the background and it'll replace any other background, the, the vertical banding, the horizontal banding, any of those effects, it'll replace with a very smooth uh, half tone uh, background and it will look um, much, much better. Uh, the other advantage is you're also taking, you know, 60 or 40 percent of the heat out of the plastic that you would be normally putting in. So you can still have the good, um, the good uh, DPI, the good quality of the engraving, but that'll smooth out the background and take some of the heat out. And I know you had a later question about how do you keep it from from warping, and uh, that'll also help with the warping a lot, especially. If you're doing, you know, more than about 40% coverage on your material, you're going to have problems with, with the heat if you, um, if you don't do something about it. Excellent answer. What are the optimal settings for 120 watt laser for two ply acrylic, such as metallic plus? Um, 120 watt laser, I mean, settings that I would use on 120 watt, um, it depends on your <laughs> brand of laser. So, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, without knowing your brand of laser, I can't give you numbers. I can tell you. Epilogue for, fusion. Is that, is that, uh, was that yeah. I, an epilogue? Yeah. And I couldn't tell you, I, I don't, I don't use an epilogue fusion. So I would suggest your, uh, you check with your manufacturer or run some testing as their top speeds as well as their acceleration curves are totally different than ours. And so um, off the top of my head, I would run it probably around 30 to 40, 50% power at, at full speed um, at like 500 DPI is where I would run it, you know, by default. But, um, you know, not, not being familiar with your system, I can't tell you exactly. Yeah, one, one trick for that would be to um, pick a speed and a power. Um, one of the things people um, get wrong with engraving plastics is it's it's intended to be engraved, you know, three thousandths of an inch deep. You almost shouldn't be able to feel the engraving and people like to go, you know, deep into it, um, which just causes problems. So pick a, pick a, you know, 100% speed and pick a power, 30, 50, whatever it is. If you're through to the second color, reduce your power by 5% and try it again. And keep doing that until you're not through and then go back up. If you're, you should be like so close to the edge that 5% change makes a difference between it engraving or not engraving, really. Yep, absolutely. You know, when it comes to settings, sometimes trial and error is necessary. And, and Alan has a great point to, you know, don't overpower it just because it looks good. It's going to cause more problems than it's worth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, is Trolley's texture acrylic best for outdoors or for heat and cold, dusty, wet, muddy environments? Will it survive a drop onto concrete? Um, yes, uh, the answer is a short would be absolutely yes, but I'm going to let Alan take this since he uh, runs our material division. Well, there's there's <laughs> parts parts that are yes and parts that are no. Uh, Trolley's texture is one of the best materials to use outdoors uh, as far as heat and cold. Um, it is not the best material to use for dusty, wet, or muddy environments simply because it's got that textured surface, so it's going to be harder to clean. It's going to actually collect dirt uh, more than some of the other materials. Um, will it survive a drop onto concrete? Uh, again, depends. If it's, you know, from four feet and it doesn't land directly on a corner, it'll be fine. Um, I've seen, you know, boxes where UPS has dropped it on a corner from six inches off the ground and shattered the corner. Um, so it's, it's not, um, none of the acrylics are, are really great for impact resistance like that. They're better 
Uh, they're better than a pure acrylic because they do have some of the ABS and, and some other things in to make them impact resistant. Um, but they're not really drop resistant in, in that sense. Um, other materials that you might want to look at for outdoors uh, that will have all of the same applications but won't collect the dirt. Um, reverse materials are, are excellent for outdoor use. Uh, because the entire engraving and everything is protected by a, a 1 16th sheet of UV stable acrylic. Um, and you have a smooth surface that's easy to clean and doesn't collect water or dirt. Um, and then there's a couple other, the, the Trolley's Ultimate Mats and Ultimate Satins also have an extra cap that's specifically for the UV stability and the weatherability. All right. Good answer. Do you recommend using hexanes to remove the sticky edges on the two ply? Absolutely. Um, it, it will not eliminate the stickiness. It will reduce it, but it definitely um, helps take some of that stickiness away. The stickiness will reduce over time. After a few days, it will go away. If you ever take any plastic signs that you've cut, you know, from a few weeks prior and, and touch them, that's completely gone. So mm -hmm. if you do want it and, and be delivered right to a customer quickly and you want to reduce it, yes, the hexanes will definitely help that. I would also suggest a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. Just rub it dry on the edges of the material and it'll pretty much remove it completely. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Trying to engrave signs with two inch high text on dark blue cap, white core, 16th inch uh, uh, Romark Ulti grave sheet with a Speedy 100. How do I reduce the blue staining of the white, um, the white engraved text? Uh, well, I kind of covered this with the red on white. And then I, as I said, the blue on white. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's one of the brands that tend to have that on some of their some of their versions. Um, there's not much you can do. Uh, unfortunately, it is. it has to do with the, the color and how the actual spectrum of light is actually absorbed with it. Um, taking it out of focus a little bit, you know, making sure not to use like the small mouth cone or air blowing on it will definitely help. But ultimately, when you get a lot of staining on the background and that blue haze, the only real effect, as I showed you in that slide, is uh, to run a second light pass. Now, you can actually run that second pass as a low DPI if you want. So run it again, but like 250 DPI so it goes quicker and just kind of cleans it up um, so that it can speed it up. But there's not a lot of tricks. The hexanes will also clean a lot of that blue out um, and may allow you to, to kind of protect that or get it good enough. But unfortunately, I would suggest maybe looking at a few different brands and maybe finding one that doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just reiterate too, definitely bottom-up engraving, definitely... I mean, I would suggest don't use air assist on the engraving of that material at all. Um, and then the other um, the other suggestion would be to look at whether you really need to use that ultra gave material for that uh, application because that particular material does have a thicker cap than normal engraving materials, which means you're starting off with more blue and you're removing more blue. So yep. it's got, it's gonna go somewhere. Yep. Um, yep. Blues and definitely, red, man. Yeah, definitely bottom up and definitely uh, no air assist or very low air assist on the engraving part um, might help. Yeah, definitely. Um, the hexanes will definitely help. Um, yeah, but uh, all of the above, it, it, you know, it comes down to those are the color blue and red are the colors that in a lot of cases, you just have to accept it run it with multiple passes and charge a little more for those colors. Where can we purchase PET and PETG? Um, I gave you a QR code uh, it, during the actual seminar um, and you can go to the um, engraving supplies and or engraving hyphen supplies.com to purchase it. Um, can Delrun be painted? What is the best method for permanent marking? Um, as I kind of stated there towards the end, Delrun is not a real paintable surface of material because it is self-lubricating material. I have never found a paint. Now, down inside of an engraving at, where it's rough, it, it has been okay, but it just really doesn't last down there. Um, if you need the contrast, the fiber laser on the black is ideal. 
Um, but it, it, you know, it really is not a paintable service. Um, I do know even like the companies that do like UV printing on plastics, Delrin is not one that they'll typically do because it'll flake right off. So yeah. when it comes to color fill on Delrin, you don't have a lot of choices. Um, and I really don't have a lot of uh, solutions for you in that manner. Uh, Alan, you know of any others that may c come across for, for that type of plastic? Nothing that I would guarantee. I mean, you could try marine enamel uh, and color fill it. You could try something like, uh, if you can find it anymore, like a rub and buff, a, a solid uh, paint fill like that um, might work. But it's I mean, the, based paint, yeah, yeah, it might work. But but all of those, I mean, the the, the whole point of Delrin is that stuff doesn't stick to it, basically. Yeah. It's like a um, Teflon almost. Yeah. yeah. The other one that I was just thinking too is maybe a two part epoxy. Um, you know, mm -hmm. where it's, it's put into it, squeegeed on or mask, a uh, mask and then ro rolled down in and then let dry. Uh, I've never tried it, but it is, it's just one of those materials. If you have to color fill it, uh, there's not a lot of choices in this manner. Mm -hmm. Is Delron expensive and does Trotex sell it? Um, it is kind of expensive and we do not sell it. Um, and I apologize if you go to that scan QR code for McMaster car, that's where I buy it from. Most industrial or plastic shops, uh, local plastic houses will sell it. Um, mm -hmm. It is considerably more expensive than some of your other plastics. So um, I would go to McMaster Car or any local plastic supplier to buy it since it is more of an engineering-based plastic. Mm -hmm. How do you handle flare-up, flame-ups uh, if something catches on fire? Um, I, I like to throw my hands up and run. But probably not recommended. No, um, <laughs> honestly, just <laughs> you, you want you want to keep a very close eye on it. Um, typically, if you do have a flare up on the laser system, there's kind of a rule of thumb. Um, if it is a small flare up, the first thing you want to do is you want to stop your laser, lift your lid immediately if the flame is not too large. Um, if it's a very, very small one, you want to lift it, it's going to stop the ignition source, which is the laser beam. Um, and in most cases, that's going to stop it. Um, I do suggest getting, uh, you know, the the small little handheld cans of uh, uh, fire extinguisher. They're basically like a can of spray air, but they're also a fire extinguisher. So you're not pulling the large one off the wall for for minor minor ones. Uh, sometimes I'll also use the can of spray air upside down. Just make sure it's not the flammable version that can cause problems um, to blow out those fires. Um, in most cases, when you lift the lid, it will stop your the laser beam, which will stop the fire. Um, sometimes you can blow it out. If the fire is too large, um, you want to shut your exhaust off immediately because you don't want it pulling that flame into your exhaust, taking out your building. And if that's the case, shut your exhaust off, fire extinguisher, take it out. Um, you'd much rather lose the machine than your building. So yeah. um, it really depends on the scenario. But the, the key is you should never get to that level. You should always keep a close eye on it, especially when cutting plastics. Um, and so it should never get to a level where you're having to pull the extinguisher off the wall. And it should be a CO2 fire extinguisher. The, uh, the chemical fire extinguishers will actually do more damage to your machine than the than the fire will in in a lot of cases because the uh, the powder that they use is abrasive and you, it gets everywhere and you yeah. never get it out. Yeah, I, I've so had to CO, do one. <laughs> CO2. Yeah, me too. Everybody, <laughs> anybody that's been in this business for a while has set yeah. a machine on fire. Yeah, um, yeah. CO CO2 uh, fire extinguisher. Um, it, you everybody really should have one close to their machine anyways, Absolutely. just in case. And I was sitting right there when mine happened and it can get away from you quickly. So be very, very conscious, mm -hmm. uh, especially on certain, especially in the plastics market. Um, this is one yeah. thing that you, you just, you, you, you can't look away. And I, I've had customers tell me, oh, well, I've been doing it for years, you know, and I just, you get complacent with it, but build up and residue and little pieces form up and that can cause your problem. So always keep your machine clean yeah. from residue and debris um, and always keep an extinguisher and a very close eye, especially when you're cutting acrylics or plastics, yeah. any plastics. I, I had a customer once, they were an engineering company and they came up with this, this system where they had nitrogen. So they were blowing, they were basically flooding the case with nitrogen whenever the machine was cutting and they figured this would allow them to just, um, you know, run it unattended. Nothing could ever happen. And uh, the valve froze up. Oh. And they and they burned their machine to the ground. Yeah. So. 
Well, never, never great. leave it unattended. Yeah, yeah. nitrogen is great because it displaces the oxygen, and that's great, great, but also an expensive solution. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's just one of those things. If uh, it, it really comes down to the scenario, make sure small ones stop your laser, leave your exhaust on, so it's not uh, not filling your uh, environment up with smoke. Uh, large ones shut your exhaust off, so it's not pulling your flame into your exhaust or your ducting uh, or your filter system, um, and then you know deal with it just like any other fire. Mm-hmm. How thin do you go on Delrun sheets? Um, that's a good question. I don't I, I mean, I don't know that it comes down to thin films. The thinnest I have seen Delrun sheets is about sixty thousandths of an inch or 0 yeah. 06, 16th of an inch thick. Um, yeah. I don't think they they sell it as thin film beyond that. I haven't I haven't seen it. It's probably possible to get yeah. it, but I, I haven't seen it. Yeah, it doesn't have the stretching capabilities as like the thin films, like the PETs, and so I, I don't. I've never seen it any thinner than a sixteenth of an inch. But you know, do your research. I may be wrong. I missed a section covering ABS. Heard that uh, laser cutting ABS causes it to emit a cyanide gas. Um, uh, the cutting of ABS issue is uh, caution required for re re restoring to no, um, I mean, any plastic cutting will produce noxious gas. You always want to ventilate it, but no, there is no cyanide gas that comes from cutting ABS. No, we actually do laser, uh, ABS materials, troply materials in certain cases where, uh, certain color combinations aren't available in what, in, in the laser bolt, um, there's a, a white with pine green, for example, in, in troply uh, ABS material that isn't available in acrylic. So um, it's it smells bad and the edge quality isn't great, uh, as good as the laser bowl, um, but it's not, it's not any more harmful than any other plastic that you're gonna cut in your laser. Yep, yep, no problem running it. Uh, otherwise I wouldn't have had a, uh, 15, 20 minute section on all the different benefits of it. Mm -hmm. um, is Delrin UV rated for outdoor use? Uh, yes, Delrin is a UV stable plastic according to uh, all the sites that I have found. Mm -hmm. Off topic, not plastic. Um, but I have to ask, do any of these tips help engraving on crystal awards with a speedy and with nice uh, whitish perception? I could not find a uh, crystal is way off topic. Um, and I believe there is a, <laughs> <laughs> there is a glass uh, seminar. I didn't personally do, but we have on our YouTube channel. If you want to cover that um, glass and crystal can definitely be engraved with no problem, but there are a lot of tips and tricks. And I suggest that you go to mm -hmm. our, uh, go to the the Trotech, I think, headquarters YouTube channel and uh, or just do a search for it um, on on glass seminar. And I believe it's like a 45 minute seminar on just processing glass and crystal materials. So mm -hmm. I would suggest going to that. Um, otherwise, we're going to go down a rabbit hole on glass. And this is really yeah. a plastic based seminar. Yeah. Same same tip that I give to people doing large areas of plastic. Uh, don't do it as black art. Do it as as uh, 60 or 70 percent gray. Yep. And because uh, crystal, the problem with crystal is heat. Yep. Typically. Heat and fractures. Yeah. You can get yeah. any fr f fractures. Yeah. 78% gray is definitely that. That's one I've been using for 20 years. Can the acrylic cutting table be used with an epilogue? Um, actually, uh, as long as the cutting table matches in size, our acrylic cutting table is actually a grid that sits on top of an existing metal table. So yes, um, you could order as long as it's the right size, depending on the size of your epilogue, set our acrylic grid on top of your metal grid and then benefit by the thin materials. Um, I do suggest the acrylic cutting table for only thin materials. I found out the hard way that thick cutting because it builds up too much heat can actually cause the cutting mm -hmm. table to ignite. So be very careful mm -hmm. about that. But if you're cutting thin acrylics and you would just want to eliminate any type of reflection point, yes, definitely. And if our, our grids will cover the size of your epilogue, you can set it right on top of your epilogue as long as it'll fit mm -hmm. or if it can be trimmed to fit, then yes, the answer is yes. Do you have any tips to reduce the, uh, the stickiness from the cutting cutting trolleys from the adhesive backing? I mainly cut uh, Legends plastics and the tacky edges trap cutting dust and divert uh, for uh, for the for the mm -hmm. from Tex fingers. I don't know what Tex finger or Tex fingers are. 
That means um, when they're handling them afterwards. Uh, oh, the text figs. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you had a good example. The hexanes definitely will reduce the stickiness. Um, gloves will definitely have it. But uh, the magic eraser trick that you said earlier was a good one, too, to, mm -hmm. to rub the edges with the magic eraser. Magic eraser is tricky, though, because it does have a pumice. So you want to really just kind of hit the edge or stack your yeah. part and then run them all at once because it yeah. will scratch the, micro scratch the surface. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you could do if this is possible is um, basically do like a two tray system or a three tray system or something like that where you cut them, you pull them out without handling them, and you just let them sit for like a couple of days. And that will make a big difference in how sticky they are when yep. you do go to try to handle them. Yep. I find about 48 hours and yeah. the, the, the solidification, the solidification of the, the molten material has completely solidified and there's no more issue. Yeah. Also, where can I look at additional cutting tables? Uh, we have the engraving table and honeycomb interested in seeing other options. Um, it, this depends on what laser, of course, brand you're using. Um, you can go to right to the Trotec website if you wanna look at the different table choices and see which tables your laser will support. Um, some of our laser systems like our Speedy 360 and 400 will support up to seven tables. Um, mm -hmm. So you can do slat tables and acrylic cutting grid tables. Um, but depending on your brand of machine will depend on what tables are supported. So uh, contact your manufacturer or contact us and we can definitely tell you what is um, supported on your machine if it's a Trotec. What is the, uh, the tool used for the ADA Braille? Um, and did you write and verify the Braille uh, is correct? Um, the tool that I used was the Braille raster pen, which is uh, created by Accent Signage System. They're out of the Midwest, I think out of Minnesota area, but mm -hmm. um, they uh, they actually make it and they sell the licensing and they also teach you all the in and outs. And I'm not certain. I pulled that ADA sign that I demonstrated off of a California ADA website. So I hope it's correct. Um, but if not, yeah, the companies that sell it, like Accent Signage System, um, if you go back and watch that section, there's a QR code. You can scan it. It'll take you to their website. Um, they don't only sell you the, the Braille raster pen, um, but also the licensing and the training to make sure that the ADA is certified. Um, if mine was not, I apologize. I'm not an ADA specialty, but the process that I showed you is correct. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of braille translators that are available. Um, if you have Sign Lab or Engrave Lab, Vision Pro, it's all the same software. They've got a braille translator built in, uh, but there are, are third party ones where you basically type in, um, you type in what you want it to say in English and it translates it to braille. I just but use a braille font. So the, I, I, I type in the number that I'm gonna do and I type it to braille font and then stick it down there. It's not, not right. No. Okay, so so there you go. <laughs> no, it's it's actually not one of one of the easiest ways you can tell if a braille sign is right or wrong is you look at the numbers, and the number of digits in the sign, your braille always has to have one more. No, well, well, there you go. Because there there are no actual numbers in braille. It's all number sign and then A B C D E F G H I. Hmm. Whatever. I'm going to tell you, I'm not not a Braille expert, but uh, I can tell you how to make it. I used it to be. Time. Oh, you used to be in your other life, huh? Oh, well, good. This is why we invite you. Yeah. Do you know if the engraving test patterns that are accurate to help determine the best uh, in uh, settings for engraving? Um, I do provide, uh, especially I, I have a a laser hack that I have put on our Trotec uh, USA YouTube channel called uh, uh, for creating parameters. Um, it is an actual pattern based little wheel that I have designed that allows you to run all the different colors in the Trotec driver all at once so that you can dial in settings, not just one setting because there's really no correct setting on most materials. It's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, something like wood, you've got an example of uh, the whole spectrum of it. And so if you watch, go to, you know, type in laser hacks, um, go to our YouTube channel and then look at the parameter set and it'll walk you through exactly how to create parameters. Um, and then it'll give you downloadable files on to how to create your own settings. Um, and not just one setting, but all the settings of how a material is going to handle 
the laser energy. And I would suggest looking at that and uh, and then moving forward with that. Um, if you have any questions when after you've watched that, just post it in the comment section and uh, I keep an eye on it and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Lastly, what is the material used for two-ply materials such as Trolay's Metallic Plus? Um, dang, that material smells like garlic on steroids. Um, Alan? <laughs> uh I've never thought of it like garlic on steroids, <laughs> but now that I think of, yeah, that's yeah. that's as good a way to to uh, describe it as anything. Uh, it's it's technically called a modified impact acrylic, and basically what that means is it's acrylic, but with other things mixed in. There's a little bit of rubber. There's a little bit of ABS, and that's what allows it to flex a little bit, and that's what makes it more impact resistance resistant than um than pure acrylic uh it, if you take a sheet of the trolleys and you hit it with a hammer um you probably will put a dent in it depending on how hard you hit it um if you hit a piece of acrylic the same way with the same hammer it's going to shatter um and so that's why they call it a modified impact acrylic uh because that's what the goal is but uh yeah it's it's 99 acrylic resin um and then the other little things are what gives it that flavor special sauce special sauce <laughs> do we have glow in the dark acrylic i do i don't think we cover that one now no we do not um there romar had a glow yeah. in the dark one I don't, I don't know if they still sell it though i i haven't seen it on their website for a while it's it was super expensive it was very uh, expensive. it had a limited lifetime like it 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 wasn't you know you put it up and 10 years later it's still glowing um so it it's it wasn't really a great option um we we have what we call fluorescent acrylics but they're really uh just kind of bright colors that if you you edge light them they glow like a fluorescent light yeah. but they don't they don't glow in the dark no no and i do know that romark's glow in the dark was just the glow in the dark it didn't have like the color cap it was just the mm -hmm. core one and exactly it was yeah. like 10 years ago that i used that and so i haven't seen it in a long time so yeah i, I would definitely run a search it may still out, be out there but i we haven't come across it Great info again on the two ply. What uh, what a great seminar today for me. Really appreciate it. Well, David, I please uh, you got a great name by the way, Dave Laser Dave. You know we, we got to stick together. Thank you so much, and we're, we're happy you enjoyed it. All right, well, looks like that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, Alan, thank you for your help today. You were You're definitely welcome. a wealth of knowledge as usual, and. Uh, just stay tuned. Uh, next month, we're going to have another Laser Hacks. Or we're going to have our Laser Hacks uh, seminar. So uh, stay tuned and, and definitely keep an eye on your inbox for future invites for our third Thursday seminar. Mm -hmm. I think this is the part where we're supposed to dance.